Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our final day of Columbia University's COVID-19 Vaccines Symposium, Unfinished Business. Today we will be discussing the topic, Looking Ahead, Next Viruses, Next Vaccines, A Five-Year Horizon. Our moderator for today's session will be Dr. Tariro Makanzange. Dr. Makanzange is the CEO and founder of the Charles River Medical Group, an African research organization focusing on world-class clinical and biomedical research. Her research focuses on HIV immunology, clinical trials, and implementation science. It's my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Makanzange to lead us through the day. Great, uh, thank you, Harlow, and welcome to everybody who's joining us uh, today. Uh, today is the exciting uh, last day of this incredible five-day symposium that has focused on COVID-19 uh, and COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, today, we're going to talk about looking ahead, next viruses, next vaccines, a five-year horizon. We'll begin today with a, a roundtable discussion, and the goal of that discussion will be to think about what lessons we have learned from our experience with COVID-19 over the last two years in terms of how best to prepare for and respond to future pandemics, whether they be due to emerging SARS-CoV-2 variants or other pathogens. The symposium will finish with an overview of this week's major take-home points from Donald McNeil and closing address by Sir John Bell. So it's a pleasure to um, welcome the panelists for today's uh, discussion. Our first uh, panelist is Dr. Timothy Endy. Dr. Endy is the program leader at the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, uh, specifically for disease X and chikungunya vaccines. His research fields include virology, developed vaccines and epidemiological study sites in Southeast and Central Asia. Dr. Endy, please go ahead. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Tariya. <clears throat> and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this important panel. I truly appreciate it. In the next uh, eight minutes, I'd like to give you some perspectives from, from our end, from CEPI, in terms of the lessons learned uh, from the COVID experience and how we're applying those lessons to uh, to anticipate and meet for the next pandemic for disease X. Um, firstly, let me point out um, a recent article that was written by um, our R&D director, Mel Seville, as the first author and Richard Hatchett, our CEO, as a senior author in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, March 2nd of this year, entitled, uh, Delivering Pandemic Vaccines in 100 Days, What Will It Take? Um, in this particular article, they did, and CEPI did an analysis of 46 representatives from vaccine development firms, international organizations, regulatory agencies to identify um, how to meet a 100-day mission in terms of coming in with interventions such as vaccines, therapeutics um, for uh, a new pandemic disease X. What they discovered was, uh, and written in this article, I'll just summarize briefly, um, strategies that enabled COVID-19 vaccine development really fell into five different categories. Um, leverage existing insights about new pathogens and development technologies was a very important um, strategy. Supporting innovation of the vaccine development process, uh, using advanced analytics to inform development and manufacturing processes, promoting collaborations among stakeholders was incredibly important and continuously reviewing evidence to support swift approval, especially regulatory approval, all enabled um, the uh, really the unprecedented approval of COVID vaccines within one year. In this article, they have a very nice table um, and I'll just refer you, refer you to that manuscript in itself. But in summary, those of us who are in vaccine development realize that traditional vaccine development approaches can be 10 to 15 years in clinical development from, from the bench all the way to licensure. Uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccines was unprecedented by having a, a year approval from the bench to, to licensure. Uh, and they discussed some of the, the reasons why that is, including the prototypic approach um, that was formulated by Barney Graham at NIAID. Um, they also looked at the current practices and, and ways to shorten the regulatory approval as well as the clinical development and find that with current practices, you could shorten it down to 250 days. And then they talk a little bit about what would it take to, to make 100 days? Um, and that really is the important point that we're trying to, to, to solve and address. 
For us uh, in Disease X, I think there are four important lessons we learned from the COVID experience. Uh, number one, which certainly this panel realizes and experienced every day, is that we can't predict the next pandemic. Um, certainly we can prepare, but we can't predict what it next will be with over 300 viruses, um, spillover events, arboviral and human-human transmission. There's just no way to really predict where the next disease X pandemic uh, will be. Um, however, we can be able to look at um, the virus families and understand the factors involved in disease X emergence and develop a methodology to, to look at the likelihood of a disease X emergence from uh, particular virus families. And to that end, CEPI is collaborating with a number of institutes, including the WHO and UC Davis, and potentially developing a real-time methodology to look at the likelihood and to rank virus families in terms of their disease X emergence uh, pretest probability. Why that's important is that um, we need to, to find a way to allocate resources appropriately to develop vaccines and interventions and therapeutics. Um, we can't develop 350 different vaccines. Uh, we can't develop 350 different monoclonals, but we could prioritize and really focus our resources and not duplicate efforts across the board. So this is one important lesson that we're applying and, and uh, currently actively trying to formulate. Number two, the lessons we learned uh, from COVID is that, uh, as we all know, as virologists, viruses constantly evolve and mutate to evade the host immune system. And that we need a better way to design better vaccines to be variant proof. But also um, the initiative is to develop vaccines that are broadly protective. Um, certainly CEPI has a portfolio trying to develop broadly protective coronaviruses. Um, and we've just recently come out with a call for proposal for computational image design where we're really trying to attempt to bring in groups together um, to be able to take vaccine design to the next level, to bring in all the different tools that we have available in a machine learning environment so that we can actually computationally simulate the, top, the, the, the proper antigens that need to be presented to the host that results in protective immunity, not only to the virus itself, but also to de design antigens in the right format to be broadly protected. So that if we had a universal paramyxovirus vaccine and a universal renovirus vaccine, it would really simplify, uh, simplify our, our ability to rapidly deploy vaccines in the, in the event of a pandemic. Lesson number three is that um, traditional vaccine platforms uh, can take long to develop uh, because of the quality measures involved in cell lines for recombinant proteins, for example. And what we've learned from the mRNA platform that it's a potentially very powerful rapid response vaccine platform. Um, to that end, you know, we are dedicating ourselves at CEPI to, to look at and develop vaccine libraries using an MRA platform. Um, and so that we could develop these very rapidly, put in the proper antigens um, that will result in um, potentially highly monotypic protection as well as broadly protective uh, vaccines. For lesson number four, um, we, we learned from COVID that we can develop vaccines in 360 days to licensure, which is an astounding feat. And certainly um, uh, the, the goal to create vaccines and therapeutics that can be deployed within 100 days of a disease X outbreak is gonna be an incredibly challenge. But that end, we, what we are doing at CEPI is creating vaccine libraries. Um, and then, but also importantly, to take these libraries in exemplar fashion uh, through a regulatory pathway, uh, through preclinical, through phase two studies, the creation of master files so that we can actually get regulatory approval of the platform itself that will allow quickly antigen switching um, and then upscaling of manufacturing to meet a potential outbreak. So to summary, I think there are some very important lessons that we learned uh, from COVID experience that we're applying um, for the next disease X outbreak. There's a lot of challenges to overcome, but I think that uh, we have the tools and the expertise, especially in a collaborative environment where we can tap into a lot of expertise to be able to deliver uh, potentially therapeutics within 100 days. So um, that's my eight minutes and I appreciate the time and, and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Endy. I think you touched on some very important points. Um, many of which Sir Jeremy Farrow touched on at the beginning of the symposium. Can we get vaccines out within 100 uh, days? And what do we need to, to be able to, to do that from uh, antigen design uh, through to 
novel platforms uh, and manufacturing. So, so next we have uh, Dr. Catherine uh, Janssen. Uh, Dr. Janssen is the Senior Vice President and Head of uh, Vaccine R&D at Pfizer. Her portfolio includes vaccines for COVID-19, uh, strep pneumonia, C. difficile, respiratory, syncytial virus, group B strep, Lyme disease and influenza. Uh, Dr. Uh, Janssen, welcome, and we look forward to your comments. Well, thank you, uh, Teriro, and thank you for the opportunity to, um, to be on this uh, panel here today. Uh, so for this panel, we have been asked to reflect on the lessons learned from our experiences with COVID-19 and how the world could better prepare for the next pandemic that undoubtedly will come in the future. So to learn and prepare for the next health crisis, it is important to look at the past and see what actually did work and what did not. So let me start with what worked well from my perspective as head of vaccine R&D at Pfizer. Early and solid investments in new technologies. We are constantly seeking out and investing in new technologies, vaccine platforms, and approaches and we as we address more difficult vaccine targets or look to improve existing targets. R&D of such innovations has been supported both by academia and the private sector and is critical to keep and augment that support in the future. As an example, in 2018, Pfizer began collaborating with BioNTech to develop a more potent and reliable seasonal influenza vaccine using the mRNA platform. We felt that the platform would also be of great advantage to address a potential flu pandemic given the versatility and now proven development speed of the platform. This collaboration gave us the opportunity to work with BioNTech and recognize and address fundamental scientific issues that needed attention to be able to use the platform effectively. For Pfizer, these 18 months were critical and gave us a head start in making decisions that led to success. Another success story is the unprecedented transparency across academia, government, and industry partners. Like never before, scientific data and inserts insights were published almost in real time to allow everyone to make better scientific decisions. Collaborations with NIH and academic institutions skyrocketed with everyone joined at the hip to fight this devastating pandemic. A third success story was the unprecedented engagement from regulators. Regulators took a pragmatic approach to regulatory requirements to expedite vaccine development without compromising patient safety which allowed us in industry to streamline our clinical development into one seamless approach for phase one to phase three. So what did not work well? To be blunt, the world was utterly unprepared. As Jeremy Farrar noted at the beginning of this conference, the world was unprepared despite many warnings over the last 20 years. Let me begin what we could do better. So, Let's start with pandemic surveillance. There is a very good global network of influenza strain surveillance that includes important organizations such as GIZIT. GIZIT has been delivering real-time SARS-CoV-2 sequence information across the world and made these sequences available to industry, academia, and others while operating on a shoestring of funding. There's also a lack of funding for early warning systems. For example, funding was curtailed for researchers that study virus populations in global environments where pandemic strains have a high probability to arise, thus potentially missing an opportunity to, de to detect viruses such as SARS-CoV-2 earlier. Insufficient global collaboration appropriate infrastructure to develop virus detection and diagnostic methods, methods were also at play, which resulted in obscuring the problem for too many months with the effect that healthcare systems were being overwhelmed. And finally, the lack of recognition that pandemics are not just national problems, but are global problems. We know from years of experience that lack of healthcare infrastructure in lower and middle income countries makes it more challenging to effectively distribute vaccines to pediatric as well as adult populations. And it makes it more challenging to get those vaccines into people's arms. And to demonstrate the point that the challenge is not vaccine supply, but rather infrastructure among a host of other challenges, 
Pfizer and BioNTech alone already shipped over 3.3 billion doses globally to 179 countries since December 2020, and other vaccine manufacturers also contributed majorly with their vaccine supplies to immunize the global population. In fact, the African Center for Disease Control, for example, stated that the challenge is not supply shortages, but logistic challenges and vaccine hesitancy. So could I have the next slide, please? So how can we do better next time? We at Pfizer recognize the opportunity to use the lessons we have learned to strengthen our preparedness against future pandemic health threats. And we believe that the world must act now with urgency and in a sustained fashion to get ready for the next one. We recognize that effective pandemic preparedness is complex and it requires bold political leadership. So what can we do? First, active widespread public health surveillance is necessary to mitigate future pandemics so we can track variants, new viruses and pathogen dynamics. I mentioned VISIT earlier, which is an organization that is dedicated to such surveillance and should receive stronger support. Second, we must cultivate a robust research and development ecosystem and continue to invest in R&D for pathogens with pandemic potential. Governments and the private sector alike should prioritize and protect funding for basic research, including investigation into the biology of viral diseases, innovative vaccine platform technologies, and small molecules. In addition, there's a need to consider novel forms of incentives and funding to support the unique nature of R&D focused on pandemic preparedness, which could include advanced market commitments, public-private partnerships, and optimized production to help accelerate innovation and expand the pipeline of future pandemic products. Third, we need to streamline regulatory processes without compromising safety or quality. Industry experiences with COVID-19 demonstrated how active collaboration between industry and regulatory agencies can expedite the delivery of life-saving vaccines. Fourth, we need to work to sustain and scale up supply chain capacity. Vaccines can only help prevent disease if they reach the people that can benefit from their use. Recognizing this, our manufacturing and supply chain professionals have been working nonstop to assure that the supply of our vaccines continue to be available to people and to meet the extraordinary increased demand resulting from COVID-19. Our experience with COVID-19 highlight the importance of expanding global supply chain networks and expediting the movement of critical ingredients and product components. And we need to address now, more than ever, creation of additional infrastructures to distribute vaccines and deliver them to the, each country and each person in the world. So while we need strong leadership from governments and multinational organizations to improve preparedness, we have also learned that the most successful partnerships are those that leverage the individual strengths and capabilities of each partner without adding burdensome governance structures or sacrificing speed. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think you, you touched on a number of key lessons learned from the pandemic and, and what we need to be thinking about um, is uh, pathogens with pan uh, uh, pandemic potential and how do we work together uh, globally uh, to address those pathogens. So I look forward to hearing from Dr. Uh, Dennis Carroll. Dr. Carroll is the chair of leadership board of the Global Virome Project. He has served as the director of the USAID Emerging Threats Division and has over 30 years of leadership experience for global health and development. Dr. Carroll? Well, great. Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be part of this discussion. Um, this is the discussion about how do we make sure we never have a COVID-19 like event again? And we've talked about that in a referring to it as disease X. How can we better be prepared for disease X? And as we know, we can't predict which will be the next pandemic threat, but we can be a lot smarter and a lot 
better prepared for what that next event will be. And I'd like to just walk through four lessons, not just from the COVID-19 experience, but four lessons that we've called over the last uh, several decades from working on emerging infectious diseases and talk about how the, those four lessons really position us to better um, prepare ourselves for the next event. The first lesson really is that COVID-19 is not a black swan event. Uh, we've heard over the course of the last two years from various corners that COVID-19 is a one in a hundred year a phenomena. Well, maybe a hundred years ago, that might have been the case. Um, but the emergence of new diseases is very much affected by population pressures and the disruptive effect we have on the ecosystem. And over the last century, we've added six billion people on this planet. And by the end of this century, we'll add another four billion. And you can't have that kind of explosive growth in human population without greatly destabilizing the interactive dynamics that occur between uh, human populations and the ecosystems around us. And it's that disruptive uh, effect we're having on that uh, balance that the events of COVID-19 are becoming more and more frequent. They're no longer one in a hundred years. They may be one in every 10 years, five years. We may be uh, learning shortly about a new emergent threat. So we need to recognize these are not black swan events. They're ones that we need to stay invested in and stay prepared for. The second is that even as we don't know what the next pandemic threat will be, that threat already exists and is circulating in nature, even as we speak today. If we were having this discussion three years ago, the SARS-CoV-2 virus already existed and was circulating uh, in bat populations. And whatever the next threat is, it already exists. And that our problem is that we don't have the insight as to where and when these potential threats may spill over. So we need to be much more thoughtful about going to the virus before it comes to us. And by that, I mean, we can use, and this is the third lesson, we can use the understanding that even as these viruses are already in existence and circulating, the likelihood of their emergence is not equally distributed around the world. We've learned that there are certain hotspots. And that again goes back to the disruptive effect we're having on the ecosystem. There are places in the world where our behaviors, our practices, and our interactive dynamics with the animal populations around us have transformed those places into hotspots. And we can use this information to understand where these potential spillover events might be to really talk about really the fourth lesson, which is knowing where the hotspots are allow us to be much more targeted and strategic about our surveillance, that we can focus in on those populations of peoples and animals where the greatest risk of spillover is and really bring a comprehensive surveillance capability to exploit that for early insight. That insight not only allows us to identify what might be a future threat, but because these are largely driven by our own behaviors and practices, it allows us to identify what are those practices that are enabling and triggering spillover events to begin in the first place. So it puts us in a position to be talking about prevention. So collectively, we have the ability to really take advantage of the fact that we can reach out and really peel back the veil of mother nature, if you will, and develop a surveillance capability that is far more comprehensive and proactive so that the lessons that we should be taking from this experience should guide us in thinking about building a global early warning surveillance capability. That really has three dimensions. The first, it takes advantage of the fact that we understand that the future threat already exists. So we need to have a surveillance arm that is focused on viral discovery, particularly in the hotspots where the risk of spillover is greatest and viral discovery that spans multiple species that allows us to look not just at human populations, but livestock and wildlife populations in these hotspots for telltale signatures of potentially high risk viruses. The second is that the surveillance system needs to also target interface 
where humans and animal populations are interactive in a way that enables spillover events to occur. And to use that interface surveillance to get the earliest possible signal of a potential spillover of a high risk potential pathogen. And lastly, we couple this to ongoing active human surveillance, which is to be able not only to identify where viruses are circulating, where they may be spilling over, but getting much earlier signals when those spillover events occur before those viruses have the opportunity to establish community level spread, when they're still largely inefficient in their transmission. A comprehensive surveillance capability, targeting hotspots, spanning multiple sectors, essentially promoting a One Health proactive longitudinal approach to surveillance. As we think about disease X, this kind of strategy will allow us not only to begin identifying um, high risk candidates, but it again, going back to the points that were being made about CEPI, it allows us to beginning to developing a comprehensive genetic database across the different future threats so that we're not dealing with a handful of coronaviruses that we know about today, that we have the ability to develop a much more comprehensive genetic profiling that will give us the capability to use machine learning and other innovations to be much more thoughtful and innovative in developing that next generation of interventions, both vaccines, but I'll also argue it's an opportunity for us to be thinking much more strategically about prevention. So I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Carol. You, you touched on several important things, including reminding us that COVID-19 was not a black swan event. The pathogens are already um, out there and we need to do a much better job of surveillance. And vaccines remain a really important component of our responses to infectious diseases. So I look forward uh, to the comments now by Dr. Wolf. Uh, Dr. Wolf is currently the branch chief for the vaccine program in support of the CBRN division of the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, known as BADA. He leads development and management of vaccine projects that target biological threats. Dr. Wolf. Great. Thank you for the invitation to, to be part of this panel. So Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, or BARDA, is under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. And our, our mission involves protecting populations against a range of threats to include chemical, radiological, severe burn and blast injuries, and of course, biological threats. Most relevant to this roundtable discussion are the, the bio threats for which we aim to protect against. Um, and these include, you know, things like anthrax, smallpox, and Ebola, sort of the traditional biodefense threats, but also pandemic influenza and emerging infectious diseases like COVID. So our mandate is to support the advanced, the advanced research development and procurement of medical countermeasures, drugs, vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics in three broad areas. Those three broad areas being seaburn, flu, and emerging infectious diseases. So we do this by working with pharmaceutical companies, biotech, and other product developers to transition the most promising medical countermeasure candidates from early stages of development through advanced development and ultimately through regulatory approval. So we support vaccine sponsors through public-private partnerships that consist of funding support and importantly also guidance from a diverse array of subject matter experts across the development space. And as a result, we've helped to get several vaccines to licensure by the U.S. FDA, including things like Biothrax for an anthrax post-exposure prophylaxis, Genios for smallpox, and, and recently Erbivo as the first Ebola vaccine. But we've also played a role in funding and technical support to several of the COVID-19 vaccine programs and have helped to get two products to licensure and the additional vaccine to emergency use authorization. Now, the COVID vaccine response has showed that we can get from antigen discovery through vaccine development, clinical efficacy testing, and large-scale manufacturing, and ultimately emergency use in a pretty short amount of time in the grand scheme of things when funding authorities are willing to fund efforts like manufacturing scale up and production at risk, assuming success. So there's some key lessons learned that can be applied when looking forward to the next threats as well. So efforts to develop prototype vaccines against viruses that have potential to cause epidemics or pandemics would go a long way to improve our preparedness posture, but this will require significant financial resources. 
leveraging vaccine technologies and platforms that have been utilized in previous programs, successfully utilized in previous programs, helps in expediting the early development activities, such as developing that initial vaccine construct and forming clinical study designs. For these vaccine technologies, it's critical that we gain full understanding of their operational use in terms of dosing strategies. For example, some approaches may truly be amenable to single dose vaccines or we'll need clinical development programs that are able to tease out the appropriate dosing schedules for newer technologies in terms of number of doses and schedule for a total regimen. Future response efforts can also be approached with an eye towards technologies that may remove some of the bottlenecks associated with ancillary supplies like needles and syringes. We're interested in alternative administration approaches like microneedle patches and oral tablets. However, it's important that any new approaches use raw materials that may be readily available when needed so we don't remove one bottleneck with ancillary supplies only to create another potentially stricter bottleneck. And while the development of COVID vaccines and Ebola before that progressed fairly quickly, there are still downstream bottlenecks in terms of manufacturing and distribution. Now, the current paradigm of vaccine manufacturing involves validation of large-scale processes at one or a small handful of facilities. And while that helps to ensure the integrity of the product, there may be ways to further distribute the manufacturing process, especially with candidates based on nucleic acids that are closer to chemical synthesis than the more traditional biological processes traditionally used in past vaccine manufacturing. An ideal situation may consist of a manufacturing platform or printer of a small enough footprint that it could be fielded at pharmacies and hospitals and calibrated for use in lieu of traditional validation, although you know, substantial regulatory hurdles with that sort of approach. All that said, it's important that we continue to include cost of goods in our overall analysis of programs. It's obviously critical that vaccines are effective, but also important that they are affordable globally. Now, Alberta has invested and will continue to invest in promising vaccine technologies that will help prepare for and respond to future pandemics. And we'll generally do so in the context of applying these technologies to the threat areas in our mission space. And now we need to keep an eye towards the next priority threats that could be an issue in terms of pandemic preparedness. You know, multiple organizations have published short lists of emerging viral threats that represent pandemic potential. And most of these lists include Ebola viruses and Marburg viruses, in addition to monkeypox or pox viruses in general. And we've made progress on those fronts in terms of vaccine availability with Genios and Irvivo. But these lists also include viruses like Lhasa, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, Hendra and Nipah virus, and Rift Valley fever. There's also an appreciation that we do need tools in place for disease X. So those viruses that are yet to be discovered or yet to cause significant outbreaks, but are, as uh, Dr. Carroll mentioned, already exist in, in animal populations. So diversification of our collective investments in vaccine manufacturing technologies and imaging present, presentation platforms would, uh, would put us in a better position to respond to the next threats. And while COVID vaccine responses have been a success in terms of quickly getting the efficacious vaccines, investments in additional approaches for RNA-based vaccine delivery and alternative virus vectors, named two potential opportunities, could help us optimize the key performance parameters of the next generation of vaccines. And we can and should be investing in these technologies with the end game in mind. For the next pandemic, it may require higher levels of protection if the disease has higher mortality rates or a better reactogenicity profile if rates are, are lower. With some of the next potential threats in mind specifically, they represent viruses of pandemic potential, but these viruses also cause diseases where we may have an opportunity to intervene at the outbreak stage prior to a full-scale pandemic. We can make, make investments against these threats with an intermediate level of preparedness in mind, pushing candidates through clinical development and demonstrating the consistency of manufacturing under GMP conditions while generating enough clinical trial material that the vaccines could be used in an outbreak setting if needed. And I will stop there and look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. I, I think you've touched on several important points on the complexities of going from research, clinical development, and actual uh, distribution and, and shots and arms, and thinking through the uh, novel approaches that we need to be thinking about uh, to ensure that vaccines are readily prepared and get to where they need to be. So uh, um, I look forward to the con uh, comments um, by Dr. Renee. Uh, Dr. Renee is the Vice President of uh, Business Development at Ginkgo uh, Bioworks and Head of Innovation at Concentric by Ginkgo. Uh, she focuses on applying synthetic biology to outpace infectious 
diseases through biomanufacturing, vaccine, and diagnostic biosurveillance innovation. Um, Dr. Wegren, Dr. Renee Wegren, welcome. We look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. You did great. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. I, I think it'll help to just go through a couple of, of talking points. Um, hopefully everybody can can see my screen. Um, as you mentioned, I'm at Ginkgo Bioworks right now. And so um, some people might, what is Ginkgo Bioworks? We're going to add a vaccine uh, discussion about the, the future of biosecurity and biosurveillance um, and pandemic response. And, and I'd love to kind of share with you our vision for, for where um, we think this world is going um, and love to partner with all of those here on this call. And so um, Ginkgo is not a pandemic response company. We're a biotech company. We've, we've been around for about 12 years, and our mission is to uh, make biology easier to engineer. We want to understand the rules of biology so that we can make the next generation of um, products for food, agriculture, cultured ingredients, sweeteners, um, of course, you know, make things for biodefense as well. But this is part of a, a whole suite and platform that, that we're creating. And for us, thinking about things like bioresponse, biosecurity, um, it's it's really intrinsic to our business, right? For for if if we all believed in a future where where biology uh, brings solutions to the table um, for novel therapeutics, for helping combat climate change, we're going to have a lot of engineered biology in out in the world, and we're going to need a way to monitor and surveil and be able to to manage that biology. And so when the pandemic hit in in early uh, March 2020, when when you know people really realized, okay, this is probably the biological event of our lifetime. Our company responded and said, okay, what do we have to bring to the table? Um, we, we don't have the the, the pharma talent that in a, a giant like Pfizer has. Uh, we're not a diagnostics company, but but you know we think a lot about scale and robotics and automation, and and that's how we thought about um, addressing. Um, this pandemic, and I, I think it's helpful to, to just you know think about us as a, as, a, as a complementary player in this space in our whole industry, not not just Ginkgo, of course. And so you know the types of things that that we work on are, are are here, but this is you know the whole synthetic biology and biotech industry works with a variety of, of companies that can bring those solutions to the table. And my only point in showing this slide is that sometimes you have solutions that come from really surprising places. And that's important because uh, pandemics are often a surprise. We don't know where it's going to come from. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be a threat maybe to agriculture and our economy, uh, not just a, a human pandemic threat. And so by understanding biology and, and building these capabilities, um, we can, as, as an industry, be in a good position to respond to whatever that, that threat might be um, and, and have responses for detecting a threat through biosurveillance and environmental sequencing, for example, intercepting a threat. So once you find that signal, really honing in and, and fire breaking its spread, um, and then mitigating through therapeutics, nucleic acid vaccines and gene encoded therapies. And, and having all those under, under one roof um, is something that we had the opportunity to, um, to, to really demonstrate during this pandemic. And that's what I'll share a little bit with you today. Um, so, so one of the, greatest, I think, achievements of, of this pandemic has been the uh, the rise and validation of mRNA vaccines. So those of us that have been in the field for a while know this wasn't a, a surprise that came out of nowhere. This is lots of hard work over more than a decade to, to get to this point. Um, but in addition to the actual vaccine formulation and fill finish, um, things like vaccinia capping enzyme were really used at, you know, potentially just grams uh, uh, globally, and, and that had to be really scaled up dramatically to be able to provide those raw materials for manufacture. And so when we think about um, a warm stockpile or an active stockpile as, as we go forward, we heard a little bit from Dr. Wolf at, at VARDA, um, we also have to think about these core components that are going to be um, consistent across whatever your, your vaccine might be, whether it's it's you know a chick vaccine, a chicken guinea vaccine, or, or an anthrax or, or beyond. So um, other raw materials like like plasmid production and, and strains uh, to, to create those um, types of activities is going to be in, important to, to also have. And of course, the delivery formulations uh, to, to bring those to where they need to go. So you can think about the biotech industry in that way. Um, but in addition, thinking about um, scale and, and monitoring and one of the opportunities that that re we really thought could be helpful in this pandemic is you know again we won't be able to compete with a with a typical diagnostic provider, um, but we can maybe get access with some of the non traditional players, for example, in K twelve schools, um, where asymptomatic testing uh, might be useful, which has was not routinely done before this pandemic, and of course sequencing 
um, and even bringing uh, in a small way pilot programs to places like airports where we know travel related uh, spread of disease is going to continue well beyond this pandemic. And so what does it look like to have um, even a collection in that in that type of um, atmosphere and and then, of course, environmental surveillance as we shift from a pandemic phase to potentially more endemic things like wastewater allow us to still have access to a lot of data from a large population without necessarily having to swab everybody every week. Um, so this is a holistic view that, that, that we brought to the table um, at Ginkgo and, and with many, many partners uh, across the country to try to deliver this. Um, the other point I'll make here in terms of lessons learned, again, Operation Warp Speed, incredible success. Globally, we, we see um, mRNA uh, vaccines taking hold. There wasn't the same energy and coordination around biosurveillance um, and diagnostic, and that continues today. And I think that's important to note here as we ask, are we ready for the next pandemic? Um, I would argue no, and this is an area that, that we need to really continue to invest in and invest in um, really strategically as we go forward. And if, if, if you do make an investment, I just wanna give you one example of what that could look like and in, in the type of scale um, that's possible. So through many partnerships, over 50 labs across the country, um, we've now swabbed over 7 million uh, of what we would call endpoints, but samples to date, um, over 20,000 genomes and uh, more than 4,000 organizations. These are K-12 schools to four U.S. airports. And so here we're, we're doing things like bringing asymptomatic testing in, in, in schools adjacent to travelers coming in from, from international points of entry. And looking at that data side by side is something that um, had not previously been done before at scale. Um, as we think about the next pandemic, you know, lessons learned from that is, wow, you can really find things early coming in at a port of entry, and then you'll eventually see it in the community. And not a surprise scientifically, but like actually had not really been observed under it in a, a single network before. So this was exciting for us. We'd love to bring One Health to this um, moving forward too. So looking at um, the potential for zoonosis and, and animal threats. So there's a whole other bioinformatic and, and biosurveillance layer that, that can be linked here, of course. Um, and, and really this is just uh, the, the last slide before I go to kind of a, a closing remark. Um, but just to show you the power of having something like this in, in place, um, so this is looking at different lineages over time, um, sequencing from our program from, from passengers coming in at airports. And so we have this, this public-private partnership with the Centers for Disease Control, Quarantine Blanche, um, and importantly, uh, a, a party inside the airports um, called Express Check which was formerly Express Spa. For those of you that are frequent travelers, you can get your 15 minute massage before you go for a flight. Their business kind of dried up during the pandemic. And so it was these non-traditional partners that had access to really interesting spaces like airports that could repurpose their infrastructure for response. And so another lesson learned here is it's not gonna be the usual suspects. Like look around you, who has access, who can uh, be scrappy and pivot and, and help with a problem. And so working with Express Check collecting in the airports, we're doing the sequencing. CDC is, is helping bring this to public health. Um, we detected um, very early in December, the first BA2 and BA3 lineages, um, as well as some other sub lineages um, from Omicron. Importantly, um, this was in the case of BA2, seven days before it was detected um, in communities. And for BA3, it was 42 days in advance. And that is when we talk about shrinking the timelines to vaccine manufacture, that's gonna be really important uh, technology development, but paired with biosurveillance and early warning that can let you know, okay, here's something to worry about. Now, you know, direct your public health response. Um, it, we're really excited about, about moving that forward. And really looking ahead to the next five years, um, we wanna be part of building the neglect resistant infrastructure. I say neglect resistant, I've been around long enough to know the panic neglect cycle of, of funding here. Uh, we wanna make um, this infrastructure resistant to that um, in building the, the infrastructure we wish we had in place in, in November, 2019. Um, other lessons learned here, I think um, really investing in genomic epidemiology is something that, that should continue going forward um, well beyond COVID-19. Uh, in the United States now, H5N1, um, is, is now in, uh, found in migrating birds and, and now poultry farms. Um, and that's a risk to humans as well. And so, you know, making sure that we're looking beyond COVID is going to be um, really critical. And uh, again, emphasizing those pri private pu public partnerships. Thank you for the opportunity and really looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you.
Thank you. I think you, you touched on some important issues on combining technology and surveillance to be better prepared for, for, next, uh, for the next pandemic. Our next speaker is, is Dr. Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson is a Schmidt Science Fellow uh, at the Medical Research Council Center for Global Infectious Diseases Analysis at Imperial College. He leads the Imperial College's uh, uh, London uh, COVID-19 response team's modeling efforts, focused in particular in low and middle income uh, countries. So um, Dr. Watson, we look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Turo, for the introduction. So I'm going to start by talking about the lessons learned from leading the Imperial College COVID-19 response team's work in modeling the global response to the pandemic. And we'll focus on two main lessons that we learned. The first really addresses the issue of data gaps and the unknown biases in surveillance and how this hindered timely decision making across the world. From the beginning of the pandemic, we saw international comparisons between the reported number of COVID-19 cases and deaths. Um, and these comparisons were very harmful in terms of creating both incorrect levels of concern and levels of relaxedness in response to the pandemic. Um, the strength of different surveillance systems between countries is enormous. And yet these comparisons were being used to both shame specific government responses, while also to uplift the responses of certain governments without necessarily interrogating the underlying biology and what was driving the differences in those patterns. This led to the estimates of the severity of COVID-19 becoming frequently contested. Um, and that resulted in uncertainty led to incorrect abilities for both researchers and public health agencies to advocate for the correct public health interventions. This led to very crucial delays and ultimately allowed the pandemic to progress into a much more severe state before we were really confident about the severity of the pandemic. The second lesson that we learned was that while there were gaps in these more traditional measures of uh, surveillance, a number of novel data sources and surveillance capacities scale rapidly to fill those gaps and assist researchers and public health agencies in tracking the pandemic. The first real area is citizen science initiatives and volunteer efforts. The pandemic generated an enormous amount of goodwill and generosity of spirits that led to key developments in understanding the pandemic. Crowdsourced efforts which enabled symptom identification, which changed in a number of countries the official list of symptoms for the identification of COVID-19, were all generated by crowdsourced efforts. We also saw in a number of humanitarian settings, distinct groups uploading evidence of COVID-19 mortality going against the official government's reported numbers. These data points allowed us to gain a much greater understanding of the pandemic spread at a global level, and again, confirm early estimates of the severity of the pandemic. Another source of new data sets were private company data sets being made widely available at scale that had not previously been seen. Uh, key examples were mobility data that enabled researchers to understand how populations worldwide were responding to the government interventions put in place. And um, we also saw satellite imagery companies donating uh, satellite images of cemeteries in humanitarian settings, which again provided key information in, in a number of locations about the pandemic related mortality that had occurred. And lastly, and touched on by a number of the previous panelists was the scale up of complementary data streams such as genetic sequences shared through GizAid, as well as large scale representative population surveys of both seroprevalence PCR testing and digital contact tracing. All of these were data that had been available in prior to the pandemic, but it's the sheer scale up of these efforts that enabled us to gain a, sufficient great, a sufficiently greater understanding of the pandemic in countries with those additional sources of data. Now, while in some countries we had a wealth of genetic sequence data, serology data and contact tracing data, the gaps and heterogeneity in that data at a global scale meant that we were still incredibly unaware of the spread of the pandemic. The majority of the genetic epidemiology community would happily tell you that they would rather have you know, a tenth or even a hundredth of the number of sequences 
worldwide if we could increase the number of genetic sequences available uh, in low and middle income countries where we are wild, wildly, wildly behind in terms of understanding the variation in the pathogen there. And so those are the main lessons that we learned while providing supports at a global level. And this then leads on to a number of key questions and going forwards that we are working on at the moment. The first is really in the short term, what are we needing to do now? Um, what we're seeing worldwide is surveillance is being scaled back. Investment for pandemic response is generally being decreased and we are at risk of losing some of the pandemic knowledge that we've gained. And so we need to ensure that tools that and that knowledge that has been gained are not lost by ensuring that knowledge sharing uh, is scaled up and that any generated software, data sets, tools are openly shared and the protocols for data collection analysis are available so that they can be rescaled up in response to a new threat. And we also in the short term need to take advantage of the window of opportunity for data collection. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen a great generosity of spirit from private companies and volunteer efforts. However, understandably, these are being scaled back and we are at risk of potentially losing data sets that could be vitally important in both understanding this pandemic, but also helping us prepare for future pandemics. As we move now on more onto the medium term, this really focuses about how we should be ensuring the sustainability of current data systems. As I said, surveillance was scaled at an unprecedented rate and is going to be scaled back. Costs need to be recovered and put back into areas which were unfunded during the pandemic. In response, we can identify which are the optimum data streams to maintain and what level of depth they need to be maintained at to ensure that we are able to respond to either a new variant or a new pandemic threat. And one of the ways that we can ensure this is by piggybacking on other data collection efforts and spreading the costs across multiple research and public health areas. Another effort that we need to ensure in the medium term is preventing reliance on potentially uncertain data streams. As I said, a number of data streams were provided by private companies. We are always going to be uncertain about whether they will continue to exist in the future. And so any data streams that we rely on need to be hedged against other available data streams to provide robust surveillance systems and ensure that we are not reliant on, say, a monopolization of specific data sharing policies. And longer term, um, and what we'd call sort of preparing for the pandemics during peacetime, um, this has already been touched on by many of the other panelists, but we were very unprepared for the COVID-19 pandemic. However, many countries will have said prior to the pandemic that they were prepared for a specific disease X threat. Certainly in the UK, we were under the impression that we were very well prepared for flu. Uh, however, what we saw was that we had supplies for antivirals for flu and we had specific vaccine stocks. However, a slightly different disease threat and we seem suddenly completely unable to respond. And so whatever preparedness system is developed needs to be less disease specific and more flexible and modular for quick deployment to any specific new threat. As well as this, we need to critically review what was actually effective in our pandemic response. We need to understand that researchers, public health agencies and governments were all generally working in earnest to provide effective responses. However, there will be undoubtedly areas that were less important and less impactful as others. And if we can identify which research areas those were, we know what to focus on in future pandemic. And lastly, it's furthering the links between private research and government sectors. While there was a general data openness and sharing of experiences, there were blind spots in each individual one of those areas, which will have been undoubtedly more able to have spotted if the links between those areas were stronger prior to pandemic emergence. And again, the last point really is about long-term commitments to investment. Uh, some of the major issues we saw globally were issues surrounding mortality surveillance and not understanding the true spread of the pandemic, as well as vaccine hesitancy. And both of those issues will not be fixed overnight. They require substantial investment in education, civil and vital registration services, and those will take decades, decades of change. And so it's really about engaging with um, aid funding and ensuring that we commit to providing systems that are robust and provide that extra level of data so we are able to respond to the next pandemic. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll open to the panel. Great, thank you. Um, so, so thank you. I think the panelists have touched on a number of key 
uh, questions from reminding us that um, the COVID-19 experience we've just gone through over the last couple of years is not a black swan event. The emerging pathogens are already here. Surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. How do we use innovative uh, technologies and approaches to cover the full spectrum from research, product development, supply chain, and delivery uh, mechanisms? And how do we enable that clinical development that's needed to get us uh, products within uh, the 100 uh, day period, streamlining regulatory processes and facilitating the open collaboration that we saw with this pandemic? So I'll start off with, uh, with a question uh, for, for the panelists and, and hope um, additional questions will come through. But one of the things, uh, Dr. Carol, you, you, you brought up is uh, identifying the hotspots. Where are those hotspots? What are some of the key factors that drive regions to be um, hotspots? And what should we be doing globally uh, to identify and uh, those hotspots and generate the surveillance data that's needed uh, to keep track of emerging infections from those regions. Sure. Well, thank you for the question. And let me say, over the last two decades, there's been um, significant uh, increase in our understanding of what the underlying drivers of disease emergence are. And we can speak with much greater specificity about uh, what the contributions of uh, population pressure, ecologic change, um, sort of animal husbandry, uh, incursions into different ecozones, how all of those come together uh, to increase the risk of spillover. Again, it's the idea that you know viruses can be circulating in many different animals, but it's really those um, events that bring an animal hosting a high-risk virus with a human that we need to be particularly concerned about. And that's the hotspot uh, risk profiling. And so we know, based on the events of the 20th century, the huge population increase, particularly in China and Southeast Asia, really had a dramatic impact, both in terms of land use change and disruptive effect on ecology, but also the dramatic surge in livestock production. All of those conspired to create a much more combustible uh, environment for uh, that interface interaction between people and animal populations. But those dynamics are enormously dynamic. And as we go into the 21st century, you know, Asia, particularly China and Southeast Asia, we will be seeing a population contraction. It's in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we'll see the most dramatic change in population and, and likelihood the most dramatic change in land use and uh, impact on the ecosystem. So it's, we need to keep our fingers on the pulse of these different drivers to understand not only where the current hotspots are, but to use that information to anticipate where future hotspots may be. So there are a combination of human behaviors, ecologic, economic, um, all come together that allow us to think much more specifically about what populations of people, animal, and geography that allow us to think much more strategically about where we need to look, not just for viruses, but for viruses that have the potential to spill over into people by way of, again, that combustible interface dynamic that goes on uh, in the world today. So I'll stop right there. Great, thank you. And, and I, if any of the other panelists want uh, want to add uh, to that, uh, do let me know. Um, I guess so. Following up on that, those hotspots are in China, Southeast Asia, and as you talked about, um, emerging population shifts and dynamics in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. Um, Dr. Uh, Timothy um, Endy, if I could uh, ask uh, ask you um, as uh, Sepi. Um, how CEPI is thinking about uh, supporting uh, surveillance or supporting um, activities in those regions of the world that are the hotspot uh, regions where a lot of the emerging viruses, the 300 plus viruses that you talked about are likely to occur. And some of those places do not have the technological ca capabilities to support 
uh, those kinds of surveillance activities. Thank you, Tara. Uh, you know, CEPI is committed to um, um, developing interventions and primarily focused on vaccines for, for low to middle income countries um, and enabling the not only the access and availability of these vaccines to LMICs, but also they're committed to um, and have a, a call for proposals for manufacturing networks that are particularly focused on developing countries to increase the infrastructure and the um, manufacturing capabilities of these countries to, to be able to meet at the next disease X pandemic. So that is one way that uh, CEPI is uh, tackling the problem. Um, as part of the portfolios of vaccines that are in development currently at CEPI, which includes uh, vaccines against Nipah and loss of fever and Rifali and others, um, there are surveillance networks that uh, CEPI is a part of in, in funding uh, to look at um, uh, the burden of disease for these types of pathogens, but also uh, to increase the capacities of surveillance capabilities in these countries that don't have the capabilities currently to be able to monitor and to support um, not only uh, surveillance, but also for uh, vaccine execution and development. So uh, there's a number of ways that CEPI is supporting that type of mission. Um, as has been pointed out by the panels, you know, um, it's committed to sustainability and um, we, CEPI is currently in a replenishment to be able to, to, to garner the funds to be able to support these activities, which is incredibly important. Great. Um, you know, some of those viruses um, or uh, potential uh, causes of, of disease um, X um, are, are going to emerge from poorly resourced uh, settings, and, and some may be localized um, epidemics, and some may spread to be. Uh, pandemics. How do we uh, bring together the public-private partnerships that were highly effective in responding uh, to this pandemic to address uh, some of the potential agents for, for disease X and enable the um, uh, uh, availability of uh, vaccines and therapeutics for those, those diseases? Um, I, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Janssen, you, you talked a, a bit about further supporting institutions like GIS, uh, AID, um, but how, how does the private sector think about working on or supporting the work on emerging viruses that may not have immediate commercial um, interest? Yeah, that's a very, a very good question, Tilario. Thank you um, for, for asking it. Um, so first of all, I would like to say that we already have um, wonderful systems in place to actually get us ahead in the game. Uh, I don't recall who mentioned it earlier, but Dr. Barney Graham, for example, at the NIH, has been a task to do precisely that and look at potential bad actors, respiratory viruses, uh, study them, and then do the kind of uh, structural antigen um, development to look for um, uh, vaccine, potential vaccine antigens, stabilize them, study them, and have them kind of ready in case that um, uh, you know, any of those uh, viruses may actually cause uh, trouble or a, a future pandemic. So I think this is the kind of research um, that I think an individual or individual companies and you may know that very few vaccine companies are actually still in the running, so to speak, right? There was a huge contraction over the years of uh, vaccine companies. So I think the companies themselves um, can uh, uh, probably be best used when it comes to the next step, if a pandemic occurs, they can muster their resources, their experience, and know how, they know how and get it done. And I think we, we, we have demonstrated that that can work very effectively. But what is most important is what I mentioned, what NIH has done. They have really increased the funding to understand this and have supported the, the infrastructure to, uh, to study those viruses. And that's just one example. And I think there could be many other centers um, where just the research uh, from, um, from uh, net, that, that's determined by, by national governance, right? How much research funding is going into those institutions? I think there's where the solution need, it needs to be. How can that funding um, come along so that we, we 
you know, not are behind in the game, but actually get ahead of the game. And uh, that's, I think, from my perspective, that is probably the, the most important uh, part of the research. So um, that's to get to, to potential vaccine antigen, but there's much more. I mean, what we realized during this pandemic, supply shortages in syringes in, I mean, almost anything <laughs> that, that we needed did occur. So I think another um, very important research uh, that could help a lot uh, to get away from syringes are the other mechanisms that are much more um, uh, you know, easily adaptable to roll it out to billions, billions of people that do not uh, require those you know, pretty specialized um, devices. So I think that's another part of, of research where I think everyone would benefit and, and, and companies um, uh, clearly are very interested, um, as I noted in my remarks, to, uh, to have those uh, technologies available. And by we do look at a lot that is coming and is being um, uh, developed in either in academia and, and, and small, more specialized companies, I don't think we are there yet. And so there's a lot of, uh, I think, research and innovation that, that can occur and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. I think you, you touched on, on several um, important issues and I, and I might turn uh, to, to Dr. Wolf who, who first sort of talked about um, novel approaches to delivering uh, vaccines. But I, I want to ask a question that has come up in the Q&A, but maybe ask it slightly, uh, slightly differently. One of the things that has occurred with uh, this particular pandemic is that we were very fortunate that multiple vaccine platforms worked quite well. Um, but in addition, we've sort of found ourselves with an emerging uh, virus that's rapidly uh, evolving. Uh, we've also found ourselves requiring multiple doses uh, of vaccines to potentially be um, administered. And that increases the uh, complexity of the logistics around uh, supplies. Um, I'm curious to hear from you, Dr. Wolf, what your thinking, uh, your thinking at, at Bader is around future pandemics, dosing, um, uh, developing vaccines that maybe have have different uh, durability profiles and really enable us to get vaccines out to people uh, at, in, um, in ways that are most effective and uh, efficient um, and enable vaccine access more globally. Yeah, thank you. So I think we're going to learn a lot from the ongoing COVID response in terms of you know, the lead products that have gotten out there in terms of what an appropriate clinical dosing regimen may look like. It's certainly true for the RNA vaccines. We'll continue to learn more about duration of protection, both in terms of clinical immune response and, and real world effectiveness. So we're going to be in a much, hopefully a much better position for the next pandemic, at least in terms of having that kind of clinical profile for some of the platforms that are most likely to be successful. What has happened for Ebola? It happened for Ebola, and it's happened for COVID. You know, we were did not have a sort of a robust pipeline of vaccines, so it ended up being, you know, we'll work with companies A, B, and C on on the several uh, different platforms. What could end up working better as we move towards more of a preparedness posture, hopefully more of a preparedness posture, is that we work with, you know, the known vaccine. I hate using the term platform, but the known vaccine platforms to develop a suite of port, uh, a, you know, portfolio of vaccines against the range of those threats of pandemic potential. So, you know, we use an RNA vaccine to try to hit Lhasa, chikungunya, et cetera, and see where that vaccine platform may align to sort of the target product profile for the threatened questions. Because some of these are gonna be more, I'll say more amenable to ring vaccination approaches where onset of protection will be much more critical than duration of protection. 
So in parallel to that, I think we can look at different ways to formulate vaccines to try to enhance the immune response. So right now we're working through our division of research innovations and ventures to look at microneedle patches as a way to potentially enhance the immune response if we're sort of delivering intradermally to directly target lung or hand cells, those types of approaches to try to see if we can't improve the dosing regimens for some of those uh, vaccine products that are that are out there in the field now. Sorry, uh, great, thank you. I think that that is going to be uh, an important component of uh, preparedness for, for the next uh, next pandemic. If I may um, ask Renee um, a, a question around sort of novel technologies in surveillance, um, and you showed some uh, nice data on, on picking up uh, emerging variants uh, early. Um, if I could sort of combine your comments with maybe Dr. Watson's comments, how could we deploy those kinds of technologies in low and middle income countries where we are seeing uh, the potential emergence of variants uh, from communities that may uh, not have ready access to vaccines, may be you know, compromised or have a, a multitude of other uh, uh, risk factors? Um, what are your thoughts around improving the access to some of these novel technologies for surveillance so that we might be better prepared, particularly in settings that are um, uh, less well uh, resourced? Yeah, I, I think that there's it's a, it's a great question. And um, cost was is a major driver, I think, to to these types of technologies that we really need to look closely at. Um, so some examples are um, for a PCR test, we know how expensive that is to run for an individual, but capabilities that allow for pooling of swabs, for example, if it's a nasal swab sample collection, I, I think really drive down the cost um, of some of these types of testing um, that again, not returning an individual result in those cases, but it allows for mass biosurveillance with a very sensitive detection and potential for sequencing. If you're if you're tolerant of a little bit less sequence information, um, I think the next the tremendous diagnostic um, uh, growth in in lateral flow assays and, and paper based tests. Let's get rid of the plastic casing um, and and really you know dipstick paper tests. I think are are, are coming online and that's been been pretty exciting. Um, along with now some multiplex testing and and getting those out to the communities where where you know not only can those tests be administered, but but hopefully linked to something like a mobile phone or you know some way to to then capture and report those results um, is going to be uh, really critical moving forward. Beyond sort of the individual and and uh, testing, uh, things like wastewater are also quite cost effective. That allow you to you can't sample everything, of course, in wastewater, but um, it does allow you to get another uh, broader look at what's happening um, in that population. I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. you. You think I have figured that out by now. But uh, uh, so Oliver, you, you touched on um, uh, you know modeling the, the pandemic in, in low and middle income uh, countries. And, and some of the big challenges are getting good quality uh, data. Um, at one point, we talked about you know even the quality of, of death registry data, et cetera, is, is quite quite limited. So now looking into the future, um, how would you um, encourage a government's communities to think about uh, data access, data sharing, uh, data collection uh, to support uh, modeling should the next pandemic emerge in um, uh, more low resourced settings? Sure, it's a really good point that what we've observed is Firstly, we really need to depoliticize um, reporting of COVID or whatever pandemic threats data it is. We saw really with the emergence of specific variants, travel restrictions put in place that potentially de-incentivize governments and countries for being transparent in their data sharing. Um, South Africa with the Omicron variant was a very keen example of this, where they were incredible in their openness and transparency in sharing data, alerting the world to the new emergent 
variant and yet responses taken by governments were ultimately unfair and really did not seem to impact the spread of Omicron within their countries. And so understanding how we can A, depoliticize that and ensure that countries are actually incentivized for sharing data in the first place is key. Um, in terms of actually just improving data quality, for something like mortality, it's a long change. It really underpins so many areas of public health and understanding really just birth and death rates will greatly improve our understanding of many infectious diseases and uh, indicators of health. It underpins um, multiple of the UN sustainable development goals, um, but these really do take considerable investment in, in improvement in quality of life across many strata. And so that's why we had to rely on slightly novel or alternative data sets, as we said, talking about cemetery photos from satellites, um, community groups uploading uh, obituary notifications to actually get a picture of baseline mortality. Um, and so those are very much bridging solutions as we move to hopefully a future where there has been that sustained investment in uh, civil and vital registration systems. Great, thanks. So my, my last question uh, to everybody before we wrap up, um, uh, you know, one of the things we notice with our governments, our politicians, the attention span is very short. We're all tired of COVID. We want to get back to life. Um, you know, Congress is reducing uh, the funding that's needed uh, for, for COVID. And we'll soon want to move on. We've done that when Ebola came. We've done that uh, with H1N9, et cetera. So I'm going to ask each one of you, what is the one thing that you would recommend uh, or suggest that uh, we keep an important focus on and make sure we resource appropriately so that we are prepared uh, when the next uh, pathogen emerges, which may be in the near future, in the middle distance uh, future? Um, what is the one thing that you would encourage governments, communities, uh, resource allocation experts to maintain an eye on and to maintain funding uh, focus, uh, focus on. I'm gonna start with uh, Dan uh, Wolf, if, if you could uh, go and just briefly respond to that. Oh, if, if I had to just pick one, that is, that's a tough one. But, um, you know, we, we really need to, <sighs> to keep investments in the manufacturing space for candidates that are progressing through clinical development. You know, it's one thing to, to have the clinical data, but, you know, especially with some of these threats that are a pandemic potential where we can hopefully intervene at the, at the outbreak stage, really critical to have clinical trial material to actually be able to use in response to kind of snuff these outbreaks out as they happen. But it also has to be done in a sustainable manner. We, we hit this issue from the Seaburn vaccine side where we're developing vaccines for threats that hopefully we'll never need doses for. Um, so it's got to be a, a model where it's not necessarily, you know, one manufacturing suite, one vaccine. You really need to push for more towards, more, obviously, some regulatory challenges here, but multi-use facilities where, you know, we can use the same manufacturer for a multitude of different vaccines to create a more sustainable program on the back end. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Renee? Yeah, I think um, I'll sneak a sneak two responses in here. One is really keeping strategic biosurveillance at places like airports, but really ushering in a new era of innovative diagnostics where, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, we all tolerated 10 days to a PCR result, but now we can hardly stand 10 minutes for an antigen test. So we need to usher in, you know, ultra fast technology, um, getting closer to those instant results, maybe not just visual, but, you know, fluorescent or, or other other quick response where, you know, diagnostic results are keeping with the pace of, of viral spread. Great. Uh, Timothy? Yeah, I think, you know, the most important lesson in, in for the future is really investment in low to middle income countries in infrastructure development that, that spans across, um, you know, the capabilities, which includes surveillance, uh, detection of viruses and other other important pathogens, but also in regulatory capacity, manufacturing, and um, 
you know, the ability to, um, to execute, you know, the challenges that are faced by them are considerable. And, and we have seen the disparities that, uh, that were obvious in, in COVID um, access, you know, to the vaccines. Um, and if we can invest in that, I think it would bring the health up, the one health up for, for the entire world, really. So that would be my, my vote. Great, that's a massive budget request there. Um, Oliver? I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm just copying the previous response, but I strongly support furthering the strengthening of um, lower middle income genetic surveillance. Um, as we saw with Omicron, we were, we still don't fully understand exactly how that variant came to be, the number of changes it had accrued, and how that specific variant initiated and began to spread. Um, and if we had known those answers just even a few weeks earlier, we would have been in a much better position globally to have understood how countries should be responding. So again, yeah, another tick for furthering LMIC genetic surveillance. Great. Dennis? Great. Look, I'm going to offer a slightly different uh, response. And I think to avoid the continued cycle of feast and famine, uh, we need to uh, help political leaders, um, economic leaders, uh, foundations, and communities to really value risk. Um, we only respond when essentially, you know, our door is being kicked in. Uh, we have to understand there's a risk that the door might be kicked in, and we need to invest in that risk. And quite frankly, 120 years ago, we were at a similar crossroads. Um, with the cholera outbreaks in London. And that event there led by John Snow's epidemiologic work allowed urban planners to understand that if we were gonna achieve the goals of the industrial revolution, high density populations were gonna require a real commitment to long-term urban planning. That was not the case prior to then. And it was a sea change in how we invested in cities because we now valued the risk of cholera, enteric diseases, and more broadly, the whole issue of health within urban areas and how critically linked that was to our own economic success, the industrial revolution. So we need to move beyond uh, individual spaces and really there's a social engineering event we need to engage in to elevate the risk of these inevitable events and invest against the risk, not against the event happening, but we need to invest in the pre-event. Great, thank, thank you, Dennis. And Catherine? Yeah, I would wish that we can go from an ever crisis mode into a mode where we actually are truly getting prepared for a potential future crisis, even if we don't know exactly when that occurs. So you mentioned it earlier, I mean, we have an example right now, there's not mo enough money available because of people are losing interest and funding gets held up uh, because of politics. And so what my wish would be that, you know, national governments really reserve, no matter who is in power, a, a funding uh, for uh, pandemic preparedness all over the world so that we can do the research and we can do the work and do the surveillance that is required uh, to keep uh, the world safe from, from future pandemics. And I think the economic, um, uh, the economic burden that we have experienced, the enormous uh, amount of loss, not just of lives, but also of, of, uh, of economic power, it's actually, it's actually it, it, it would be a small number compared to what we just experienced. So I look at this as an insurance policy. Most people don't ever expect to, to, to get sick, yet they make sure that they and their families have health insurance. And it's something like this, right? So you, you invest for the future and it has to be unsustained or we always end up in this uh, you know, crisis modes that we, we always find ourselves in. Great, thank, thank you so much uh, everybody for this uh, rich and interesting uh, discussion. I, I think that the take home really is that this was not a black swan uh, event, if I can take the, the words of, of Dr. Carroll, um, and that we need to be planning ahead so that we're not in crisis mode, uh, that we're 
ever ready uh, for the next emerging uh, threat, which is inevitable and will likely not be a hundred years from now, uh, but be much more uh, recent and much more frequent given the changes between human and environmental interactions. So once again, thank you um, everybody for uh, 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 this uh, discussion and, and uh, for taking the time to be with us uh, this, this um, afternoon and for the uh, symposium. I, I'd also I'd like to now uh, welcome um, uh, Donald uh, McNeil, who will uh, help to, to summarize the discussions that we've had um, over the last uh, five, uh, five days. Uh, Mr. McNeil retired in, in 2021 as the New York Times chief global health reporter and was the lead report uh, on the COVID-19 pandemic. And he's currently working on a book about uh, pandemics. Uh, Mr. McNeil, welcome. All right. uh, thank, uh, thank you very, very much. much. I will, uh, my, my job, job is to give a summary, summary of what other people said today as well, trying to do that. that. Um, uh, not, not counting, counting the moderators, moderators we heard from 26 different speakers. Uh, I will not try to sum up everything everybody said. I won't try to sum up everything anybody said today because I'm hoping that the audience was listening. I'll, I'll talk, talk fast so I don't get in trouble with the uh, uh, Maitre or our timekeeper. Um, and so that I don't keep everybody. Um, what, what I was, was listening for in the last four days was themes that kept coming up again and again. And I was also listening for uh, statements that broke the conventional wisdom and, and things that made me sort of sit up and go, wait a minute, I didn't know that. Um, so I hope to be, to be going through some of those today. Um, the, the four basic themes of the first four day of this were the first day, where are we now in the pandemic and where are we going? Second day, how can we improve immunization coverage and messaging on it? Third day was a bit of a breakout. Uh, how can we reach more equity in vaccine uh, distribution, and particularly vaccine manufacturing? Uh, uh, Don, um, just yes. one moment. It sounds like we have a bit of an echo um, coming through. An echo? Yes. Uh, okay. okay, is that, is that, is that me because, because I'm talking? talking or uh, does it look, look like it's coming, coming out of... of from my computer. Let I think try it's this. coming out of your end. I don't know if our technical it, team can help advise on on how we might I resolve just, that. I just pulled out my earphones and started speaking. Perfect. Is that, that's, is that better? That's much better. All right. Much better. Thank you. I'm sorry. I wish somebody had stopped me before. I, I talked. That's a lot of echo, I guess, giving how fast I talk. Um, uh, the third day was how can we re reach more equity in vaccine manufacturing? And then the fourth day was a bit of an echo of the second day. How can we increase trust, um, as in uh, messaging? But in this case, it was through the, the lens of other countries that have been looked at. And then today, of course, was a, a look towards the future, especially the next five years. On the overall question of how are we doing and where are we going, I'd say the consensus from the co chosen speakers that we, was that we did rather poorly in this epidemic. The first question that, that was taken up was, is it over? Um, the tendency of most politicians in the United States and now most media coverage from my colleagues is to say that, yes, it's, it's almost over. Don't worry about it. It's about to become endemic. We're going to get used to it. We're just going to have to learn to, to live with this virus. It's going to be a seasonal virus. The, um, the speakers did not necessarily agree with that at all, uh, the, the experts. First of all, as they pointed out, Western Europe is experiencing a pretty serious second Omicron wave of BA2, almost as bad as the first. In some places in, in like Germany, it is nearly as bad as the first. That wave could still come here as Omicron one did. The pattern was South Africa, the Britain and Scandinavia, and then to the United States. So we could still experience that. More interesting was some reflections that were made both by Sir Jeremy uh, Farrar of the Wellcome Trust and by Dr. George Gao of the CDC, uh, of Ch China's CDC, which was that China is a population of 1.4 billion people with very little immunity right now. Um, they may be on the verge of a runaway epidemic if they can't get this under control. Dr. Gao said he hoped they could, but he's not, nobody's quite sure if they can. It has 85 to 90% vaccination rates, but those are not terribly effective vaccines. They're hoping to get some of the mRNA vaccines in there right now. But so they're not producing sterilizing immunity. So you have a fair amount of transmission of the virus as possible. And of course, uh, you know, as, as Dr. Farrar pointed out, uh, evolution is partially a function of increasing numbers. And so you have 1.4 billion people in which you get mainly get new mutations in. Also, vaccine rates in China are 
quite high except among the elderly and among young children. So there's a possibility of a big wave, the wave of deaths in China is that there was some vaccine resistance there. On the other hand, on the plus side, looking at China, you do not have a very large immune compromised population there as you do in Africa. Uh, Dr. Kate Bingham pointed out that the, the you know, rising amount of evidence that the Omicron variant probably emerged in one person who was immune suppressed and probably was sick for six months or so to have that many mutations pile up. I know not everybody agrees with this, but this is one way of looking at it. And so since there's not a, a major HIV problem or a major immune suppression problem in most of China, we may not see that kind of pressure on the virus to, uh, you know, to, to mutate. Um, on the other, other hand, on the, on the non-plus side, on the bad side, we're seeing the virus moving into animal populations. A couple of speakers noted this. It's moving into the white-tailed deer population. Um, Animal circulation always has the potential to create new variants. I think we saw that in 1918, where the, uh, you know, after it sort of finished with the human population, and by about 1920 or so, it moved into pigs and then came out again in the 1930s as a new variant from there. So far, as far as we know, um, you know, COVID, uh, SARS CoV 2 is not uh, circulating in domesticated animals at any, oh, it is in dogs and cats. Uh, it is in farmed mink, but we're not seeing it uh, yet uh, circulating in large amounts in pigs or chickens or, or anything else like that, where you might see an enormous number of animals uh, cooped up in a small space in a, in a big time. So all, the, any, all these raise the possibility that there are lots of many things could still go wrong in the near future, the experts were saying. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed it. There was a recent paper by uh, Tony Fauci and David Morens, his ex epidemiology expert, just in the journal in Infectious Diseases, saying that herd immunity is very possibly a pipe dream, that we are simply going to have to live with this virus in the same way that we live with it with flu um, and expecting uh, regular vaccinations every few years. But as Jeremy Farrar said, giving the entire world a booster dose every six months is not going to be a sustainable solution. So we're going to either have to hope that enough herd immunity arrives um, through a combination of infection and vaccination or ramp up our vaccination efforts quite a bit. Also worrying on that front was Dr. Kate O'Brien of the WHO, who pointed out that because of all the effort put into COVID vaccination around the world, roughly 50% of the world countries have had serious disruptions in their routine vaccination programs, which means that there are a lot of kids in the world who have not been vaccinated against measles, have not been vaccinated against any number of diseases, and the danger is that, of course, some of those diseases like measles are actually more threatening to children than COVID-19 is. So we may get outbreaks in the near future of diseases seeing children's death, um, partially because of the effort we made in order to get vac vaccine to the rest of the world. All right. Another big question that was raised by the speakers was, how are we doing in terms of the death toll? All right, officially, we're looking at 6 million dead. Depending on what model you look at, probably the real death total is somewhere between 16 and 20 million. Now, you can sit back and say, well, we've done pretty well. That's not the Black Death. That's not Spanish flu. Many more people died in those epidemics. But if you consider that we're not in the 14th century or we're not in 1918, um, and if you consider that we had vaccines a year ago, that's not such a great record. Most of the people who've died in this pandemic have died since we developed and approved the vaccines. We have, a re we have an amazing ability to make new vaccines. We have a major problem with moving those vaccines around the world and a big problem in getting people to accept them. Dr. Somia Swaminathan, who's the chief scientist at WHO, compared it to AIDS. As she pointed out, triple therapy for AIDS was invented in 95, 96, but it was at least 10 years before those, before those drugs were distributed uh, around Africa where the worst of the epidemic was. I remember covering it myself, it was three by five, that was three million people on drugs by 2005, we did not reach that goal. And in fact, by that time, I think there were 20 million infected in Africa and we were only hoping to get three million of them on, on, on the drugs and, and didn't reach it. Um, scientific progress is actually quite miraculous. There are actually, I just looked this up, there are 36 approved vaccines in the world. In the United States, we only talk about four or five vaccines. The WHO has, has uh, has approved 10 vaccines, but in fact, there are several Chinese vaccines, several Russian vaccines, three Cuban vaccines, four Iranian vaccines, a Canadian vaccine, a Taiwanese vaccine, and a Kazakhstan vaccine. The most successful vaccine in the world may not be the one that Americans think about. It may be the AstraZeneca vaccine. This was Kate Bingham quoting The, the Economist. 
Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine is not even improved, approved in the United States, but it is approved in 176 countries. It's made in Europe and in India. It's gotten more distribution, uh, more than double distribution than any other vaccine and probably has saved more lives than any others. She expressed this to point that the J&J &J vaccine was not more widely distributed, especially since the protection from it, even from a single dose, looked pretty good. She felt that was useful in parts of the world that have not gotten the vaccine so far. And more than one speaker made the point that we are focused too much on the excellent Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, we think about them. The world has made 11 and a half billion doses of vaccines just for COVID. Um, I'm since that figure came from the WHO, I think we're talking just about WHO approved vaccines there. This is a huge accomplishment because normally the world makes about 4 billion vaccine doses a year. That's for all diseases because most, most of the vaccines are meant for the 140 million babies that are born in the world each year. So suddenly we had to protect, instead of protecting 140 million babies, we would suddenly had to protect 8 billion people at a time, most of them with two doses. Now we're thinking two doses plus a booster. So that's 24 billion doses of vaccine we're going to need to make. So even slightly less than 12 billion, we're only halfway there even now. But of those 11.5 billion doses, only about 1.5 billion got to the world's poorest countries. And the inequities are enormous. In the richest countries in the world consumed about 200 doses per 100 people, which is to say two doses per person. In the poorest countries, it was a tenfold distance they, difference. They only had about 20 doses per 100 people. For Africa, the original WHO target was 40% vaccinated in uh, by late 2021 and 70% vaccinated sometime later this year. Fully vaccinated is a moving target, so it's easier to it's talk into the doses per 100. So that would be 80 doses per 100 people in Africa last year and 140 doses per 100 people in Africa this year. Instead, we have only reached 32 doses per 100 people in Africa this year, meaning only about 15% of Africa is fully vaccinated. And uptake there has begun to fall off considerably. Some countries like South Africa have asked vaccine makers to just plain stop sending vaccines since they can't get into people's arms for various reasons. Within Africa itself, there are enormous discrepancies. Rwanda and Morocco are the two countries doing best. They're about 145 doses per 100 people. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got Burundi, right next door to Rwanda with similar population, Democratic Republic of Congo, Chad, and Madagascar. All of those countries have less than five doses per 100 people, which is to say only 1 20th of a dose per person for those countries. You know, when you look at this, I look at myself at the other end of the spectrum, and I'm sure those other people like me, I just got my fourth dose this week, and I got it at a, at a uh, pharmacy just a few blocks from my house. So I am and a few people I know are now in the 400 doses per 100 people um, end of the spectrum. So you can see the incredible inequity of the world in, in that. And these are inequities that, as everybody said, need to be addressed. The big issue that came up from speaker after speaker was the same one. Trust. You have to have trust. You have to have trust in government. You have to have trust in science. You have to have trust in the vaccine industry. And you have to have trust in your regulatory agencies. And you have to reach people through trusted messengers. And who those are varies depending on the life and the culture that you're talking about. It may be your personal doctor in some place like the United States. It may be religious figures. If, if you're in a country with traditional leaders, it may be traditional leaders. It may be sports figures. It may be popular entertainment artists. You have to find the right people to reach and convince them to give out your message rather than giving out the opposite message that the vaccines are dangerous and don't work. And the tricky part of this is the trust has to exist before the pandemic starts. As Tom Frieden, the former head of the CDC said, you can't surge trust once the pandemic starts, it's too late. Frieden made several suggestions. One was you need to make briefings frequently. At the CDC, he did almost daily briefings during H1N1, the 2009 swine flu, during Ebola and during Zika. I know because I covered a lot of those daily briefings. His successor, Robert Redfield, under the Trump administration, virtually never held a briefing during his entire year in office of the pandemic. Now, Rochelle Lenski does quite frequent briefings. She does it usually as part of the White House task force. And as Frieden pointed out, you have to constantly remind the public by saying the words based on what we know now, based on what we knew now, because the facts are very likely to change. And you have to acknowledge before they do that the facts might change and you will change your explanation as it comes along. We saw this 
repeatedly in the United States. We had facts change on how well masks worked. We had facts change on whether or not there was asymptomatic transmission. There was facts change on whether fomite transmission was more important than aerosol transmission, was more important than droplet transmission. That shifted completely. And of course, we had uh, we had a, a you know very cha different uh, changing understanding of how deadly the virus was and how safe the vaccines were. I did notice something that Dr. Frieden said that I found interesting. He acknowledged that he used reporters as sort of a focus group for his messaging, that he would test out his messaging on the reporters, those of us who were listening on the calls, to see and listen to our questions to see whether or not we understood what he was trying to say. Because very often he thought he'd done a good job of explaining some new important concept around to the world. And very often the, the, the questions from us made it clear that we didn't really understand what issue he was trying to make. And so he would then take that, go back, adjust his message and think, if I can't get the, even the science reporters to understand it, I'm not, clearly not going to reach the average citizens. Um, Part of trust was transparency in data, speaker said. Phil Krauss, who was formerly with the FDA, put in a, a plug for the WHO there, saying that from very early on, the WHO was very good at convening experts every week to describe the situations in their country and reveal what they had learned about the virus in their countries. Unfortunately, as he pointed out, you know, the WHO was a victim of, of the, of the uh, we don't trust uh, public officials and the Trump administration tried to cut off their funding, which is probably exactly the wrong response to do in the case of a worldwide pandemic. There was a lot of discussion of vaccine hesitancy in Africa. I did not hear a solution proposed. Uh, Wilmot James cited a, an interesting survey he had made. Real rejection of vaccine in Africa is relatively low. It's different from the situation in the United States and Western Europe. Mostly people want more information or mostly people believe they are not at risk. Um, and I noticed one of the commenters, a doctor from Nigeria wrote in on our comments mode, that the truth is that the perception of risk from COVID in a lot of countries like Nigeria is quite low compared to other threats, that people were more worried about, more worried about malaria, more worried about dying of Ebola, which may or may not be realistic, but more, more worried about dying of other diseases than they were about dying from COVID. And so that, and, and I saw this myself when I was covering the polio vaccine rollout around, around the world that very often uh, vaccinators were going into neighborhoods where polio hadn't been seen for years, but their kids were dying of measles. And they were constantly saying, why are you bringing us this vaccine when our children are dying of another disease? And eventually the polio vaccine campaign realized we were gonna to have to bring in a whole suite of vaccines in order to build trust with populations that they were helping. So they would hold health camps in which people would get measles vaccine and maybe hepatitis B vaccine or something else. and polio vaccine as part of the mix. Um, also involved in building trust, as Daniel Solomon of Johns Hopkins pointed out, is data, particularly data on vaccine trials. Um, people don't trust vaccine trials that seem to be done in small amounts of people. So those, so the trials that, were, that had 50,000 participants in them, as some of the big ones did, not only produced a convincing um, convincing data in a relatively short amount of time, but they also built trust in that people realize, wow, this has been tested on 50,000 people. <clears throat> um, and so, and, and there, there have been relatively few side effects. Um, once vaccines are rolled out, you have to be ready to react quickly to the barrage of lies you can expect from the anti-vaccine movement. Daniel Salmon gave the example of Andrew Wakefield. He issued his paper in The Lancet in 1998 saying that vaccines cause autism. It was 18 months before there was a first study that came that refuted what Wakefield had to say. And it was really, you know, those, those studies dribbled out over year after year after year before a big, big enough case built up. They, they're, they're, the world is not reacting fast enough to the lies of the anti-vaccine movement. And the persuasive way to, to react to that is data. Um, there were some very interesting lessons from Israel and Great Britain that, that showed up and that, that showed both how well they were doing and how poorly we do in the United States on this front. In Israel, according to uh, Dr. Sharon Elroy Price, she was in charge of public health for the uh, health ministry there, for much of the pandemic, virtually everyone in, in, um, uh, virtually everyone in Israel belongs to one of four HMOs. Um, and all four HMOs cooperated with the Ministry of Health there to coordinate their data. And in Britain, uh, as, as Dame Kate Bingham uh, said, who Dame Kate Bingham was the one who ran their version of Operation Warp Speed, um, everybody has a national health service number, so it's possible to collate data for, for most of the hospitals in the country. So that when you have a new vaccine roll out and you get a relatively rare side effect, something like blood clots with low platelet counts, 
you can pick it up right away. You've got enough enough data. And you also know the background rate of that problem, of that adverse effect in the population. And if you have enough data, you know the background rate of that adverse effect even in a subset of the population. So that if you're looking at something like um, low blood counts uh, or, or, or um, uh, uh, sorry, blood clotting that strikes mostly women of a certain age, you know what the background rate is in the women of a certain age. Or if you have something like myocarditis, which happens to strike young men, but not women or older men, you know the background rate of myocarditis in those members of the population. So you can very quickly, when panic starts to set in about those side effects, you can very quickly address that with data. We don't really have anything like this in the United States because of our fragmented healthcare system. We try to cobble together big data by looking at the VA system. We try to look at military system. We try to look at groups like the Kaiser Health System, but it just doesn't produce the kind of robust data set uh, that you need. Uh, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC, described vSafe, which is a, uh, that's a sort of voluntary uh, weekly check-in you can do on your cell phone after you've had your vaccine. Um, and that was the way they picked up the blood clots, I think she said, I don't have my notes on that. But it's not a great way to gather medical data since it's basically volunt people voluntarily, uh, you know, picking up their phone and saying, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that. Um, so unfortunately, the result of that was in the United States when we had the first, uh, the first inklings that there were adverse side effects from both the J and the J and the AstraZeneca vaccine, we paused use of those vaccines and that almost immediately destroyed trust in them. Uh, J&J &J only somewhat recovered in this country, AstraZeneca never really recovered from that, and so we lost some, some good vaccines. Meanwhile, in England, they were able to produce data so fast that the Daily Sun, a tabloid newspaper that would be the equivalent of, of you know, one of our scandal sheets that you normally would expect to join the anti-vaccine movement, was able to write in a giant headline saying, don't worry, your chances of getting a blood clot are only 0.00001%. In other words, the tabloid media, because it was getting information in a timely fashion from the government, was not playing the role that Fox News did in this country in raising doubts about the vaccine. It actually knew what its readers wanted and was, it was able to reassure them that way. Um, this is a little bit of a digression, but I've, I've been watching from the beginning of the pandemic what governments seem to induce trust in their populations and what governments don't, it's potentially as measured through, through um, uh, vaccination. Um, you know, it is very hard to put your finger on a trend. I mean, the nature of democracy, we're all in favor of democracy in theory, um, the nature of democracy is not to trust your government. I mean, you, you basically elect a government, you have them around for two years or four years or eight years, then you lose faith in that government, you lose it, and you elect a new government. Um, and the basic campaign message in any campaign is that you are the believable guy and your opponent is an untrustworthy lawyer, liar. This does not start with Donald Trump. This goes back to Thomas Jefferson and uh, uh, you know and, and John Adams, and it goes back in the British tradition. It goes back to ancient Rome, uh, a, a ancient Greece. Uh, you know the uh, the tendency to Austria, you know uh, ostracize Aristides for being Aristides and just. So um, you have to look. At, you know, do democracies do better at vaccinating their people, or do autocracies do better at vaccinating people? I thought it was going to come out one way or the other, and I turned out to be wrong. It doesn't work. Some democracies do quite well at vaccinating their people. Australia, New Zealand, the Scandinavian countries. Canada, Spain, Chile, Argentina, democracies all around the world did a pretty good job. On the other hand, so did some autocracies. China, Cuba, and Vietnam, for example, all did good jobs of vaccinating their people. In Cuba's case, with, again, two, two cases with their own vaccines. But you can't really say that there's a principle there because some democracies and some autocracies do quite poorly at this. Um, in the percentage of population vaccinated, the United States is below Western Europe, below Japan, the United States is about on a par with Iran and Saudi Arabia, not models that I consider uh, countries that you'd like to be able to say you imitated in, in you know, developing trust in government. Um, the former Soviet Union and many of the countries of Eastern, Eastern Europe are doing worse than that, um, even though they're quite autocratic. As far as I can tell, the guiding principle seems to be mostly whether or not people trust their government on health issues. Cuba and Vietnam and China all do rather badly on civil rights, on democracy, on you know, political opposition, but they do have primary health care systems that people believe focus on helping average people get, get their health. On the other hand, the oligarchical societies of, of Russia and much of Eastern Europe um, have sort of abandoned that. There was a time when Russia had extremely high uh, vaccination rates. It does not anymore. Now, it doesn't, neither does Eastern Europe. Uh, 
Ukraine, for example, is where the big measles outbreak we had in, in New York City in 2019 came from. It went from a generalized outbreak in Ukraine through, ah, two minutes, okay, I better hurry. Um, in the United States, we have sort of a capitalist equivalent of the former Soviet problem. You don't have a national health care system. We have one that takes care of you only if you have a good job and health insurance. Um, several speakers enunciated on principles of building trust. As Wilma James pointed out, trust has to come down from the very top. You can't delegate it to the health minister. Both he and Dr. Raji Tajuddin of the African CDC gave as an example the king of Morocco, who sat at his desk in a T-shirt and got the shot there in front of his people. Uh, Wilma also mentioned Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa and the current president of, of Tanzania. Natalia Pasternak uh, of, of Brazil gave a, a counter example. Brazil was a country that had a terrific uh, history of, of vaccination. Um, all right, I'm going to skip it there because I have your uh, Bolsonaro basically destroyed trust in vaccine. I, I want to talk about a couple of things that were not talked about. One thing that surprised me in four, four days of discussion, there was virtually no discussion of mandates. It is as if that has become a dirty word. Uh, we, we didn't, and yet there are many, many examples of mandates working quite well. Numerous hospitals in the United States, Fox News did it, New York City did it for its city employees, United Airlines did it, a number of places, and yet we don't discuss mandates. They work quite well during this pandemic. They work quite well for school children. If it weren't for mandates among school children, we would be having outbreaks in the United States right now of measles and others. Um, there was also, now, the one person who did talk about mandates was fascinating was the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis. He was quite proud of the fact that Greece had reached 85%. It didn't happen voluntarily. In fact, they were doing poorly up until the summer. Then he decided to start up with a set of carrots and sticks. The young people got the carrots. Hesitant young people got, got freedom cards worth 150 euros for cultural events. It was the home care workers and the elderly, people over 60 like me, who got the stick. Starting in January, they were told that if they were not vaccinated, they would be fined 150 euros for the first month and 100 euros for every month after that. It ended up working quite well. They got up to 85% vaccination in Greece. Um, and he's only sorry now that he didn't start it, start it sooner. Also, I was surprised there was really no discussion of what to do about the anti-vaccine movement over four course of four days. I'm surprised that people don't want to discuss this. What can you do to stop the lies that cost so many lives? Can anti-vaxxers be prosecuted? Can they be publicly discredited in some way? If they're doctors or other healthcare professionals, can they lose their license? Can it be pointed out how often they are motivated by money, that they are actually sellers of alternative treatments like vitamins, like chelation therapy, like things like that? But this seems to be an absolute no-go area in there. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm running out of time here. Uh, the, the, on the third day, there was a, there was a uh, it, st it stood out quite a bit different from the others. It was about whether or not we can make vaccines more quickly. I noticed that there was one big definite trend, even though the popular sentiment is that we should, um, that you know, intellectual property should be taken away, everybody should use trips. Almost everybody on that panel agreed that that would not work. There are a whole series of reasons for it. Every vaccine has 10 to 20 different patents on it, many of them for small elements, different holders of, of intellectual property are unlikely to cooperate with that. Patents are generally not the problem. Many patents are not registered even in poor and low, and, uh, lower middle income countries. You could start a vaccine factory, there isn't really any hesitation, but the real problem is it's not the patents. Just having the patents doesn't get you there. It's a great deal of know-how that goes along, the operating procedures and the regulatory knowledge in order to get your vaccine approved. You can't build a plant just for a pandemic and then let it sit there and rust because it will become an absolutely useless plant and not able, able to make anything. Um, the big comp companies, as Mansa Slawi, who spoke of Operation Warp Speed, spoke, uh, spoke the big company is not going to turn over all their patents and then create their own competition, probably weaker competition. So there's going to be have to be a way to incentivize them to make more vaccine. And as he pointed out, they make 80% of their money on the big, the big eight countries in the world. And that money is the only way they can make hundreds of millions of doses for $1 a dose if they're able to charge $30 a dose in the wealthy countries. So the economics don't work out to simply seize patents from companies and hand out to small companies. Most small countries do not have the technical ability, do not have the educated population, do not have, don't even have the storage facilities for vaccines. So um, 
as 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 Kate O'Brien of the WHO pointed out, it doesn't make any point to make a new vaccine if you are not able to get that vaccine into the arms of the countries and the people there. So we have to find another way to address this. One way was to have uh, the proposal to have fill and finish factories around the world. That's no bad, not bad. Um, and I'll stop there. I see I'm running out of time. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was um, an incredible whirlwind through the last uh, five five days. We're really nicely touching on the various things we talked about and, and importantly, at the end, talking about some of the things that we didn't talk about but are really important uh, for communities such as, as these to be thinking about and trying to address. Uh, we are coming closer to, to the end of this meeting and I can't think of anybody else who could be better positioned to really help us think about looking ahead. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sir John Bell. Sir John Bell is the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford University. Uh, he is involved in the development of research programs in genetics and genomics and the development of clinical research programs in the UK and has played a pivotal role in the COVID-19 response um, in the UK as well as uh, globally. So John? Thanks, Tarira, very much. Um, look, it's a, it's a real honor to be able to finish off this meeting and it's been a really outstanding meeting with lots of helpful and important comments. Uh, and it's a very timely meeting. Um, it's been a pretty bruising two years, I think for all of us. And I think it's a really good time not to say it's over, because I'm definitely going to say it's not over, but at least to reflect on the last two years and see what we can do that might make this better in the short term, but also hopefully in the long term. So I, I think that the key question, which is the question of looking forward, um, needs to start with what are the things which are relatively certain to happen in the future? And what are the things that might happen but we might be able to modify that if we, if we take action now. And, and I think there are a couple of things which I think are almost certain. And I, one is this particular pandemic with COVID is likely to bump on for a bit longer. So I think you know, that, that, that seems very clear. So the idea that we can all go back to normal and it'll all be fine, I think is perhaps overly optimistic. Um, and we will see variants and we will see challenges to our immunity uh, from new variants, I'm sure, over the next period of time. But the other thing, and, and Dr. Carroll, I think, uh, described this vividly, and that is the other thing you can be sure of is we're gonna have another pandemic with another pathogen and it's not gonna take a hundred years. And I just need to remind you since the turn of the century, since 2000, We've had about seven close calls of different um, episodes with new pathogens, which have had small outbreaks or regional outbreaks, uh, but which haven't reached pandemic stage. And, and so it's highly likely we're going to get more pandemics. And, and I suspect if we've had seven in the last 20 years, we're likely to uh, you know, have trouble in the next 10 to 15 years again. So it's not something we can, uh, set aside. So that's one thing we can be sure of. The second thing we can be sure of, which is important to feature in all our thoughts, is that the sort of nationalism that we saw in this pandemic, which is countries making decisions that were in their own interest and not in the global interest, is, is not, in my view, a soluble problem. And, you know, countries that um, have democratically elected governments will always, I think, act first to solve their own problems at home when it comes to these major health threats. And of course, the consequence of that is you get great bits of the world that are disenfranchised from the rollout of solutions to these problems, while the wealthier, richer northern countries solve their own problems and before they move out. And, and I think it's the nature of decision making democracy and nationalism, that means that that is not gonna go away. So whatever solutions we have, we have to assume that's gonna be in play. And that means I think a much wider distribution of capabilities that don't rely on people being generous from the Northern hemisphere. 
Um, and the third thing, which uh, I'm, it's depressing, but I don't think it's going to go away, is the this issue of lack of trust and hesitancy about all things scientific, but also vaccines in particular. And I, I just don't see any world in which that's likely to get better. In fact, I think there's a risk that it might get worse. I think we all have to work to solve that problem, but it, it has been one of the great challenges of this pandemic, and I can't see how we can easily solve that problem. So those are the three things that I think are coming down the line for sure. And whatever we do, we need to operate in that framework. So the, the, the next and obvious question is, what are the soluble things that we can tackle? And a number of the speakers <coughs> have talked about the crucial issue of global disease surveillance, which I think must be absolutely at the top of the list of things that we need to get into place. Uh, and we do, we have made progress on that, but the honest truth is I think there is a risk of a certain amount of complacency about that. We have a very good database in the form of GISAID, but the truth is you need more than a database. You need widely distributed sequencing capabilities, and, and that is not straightforward. So there are lots of countries that don't have those sequencing capabilities, and we need to work hard to make sure that they do have it. But there are other things you need if you want truly global um, uh, surveillance capabilities. One is you need proper internet connections that allow all countries to be able to deposit sequences uh, in the cloud if, they're, if that's possible. Uh, and you, you also need to have access to the kind of fundamentals of a public health system that allows you to get swabs with virus on the end of it that you can actually sequence. Now, you may think this is all silly, but I promise you, talking to a number of colleagues in African countries, this is all, this is not straightforward and it shouldn't be assumed that that's all necessarily in place. But even in terms of the management of data, let's say we could generate widespread sequencing capabilities. The management of the data requires more than, than simply a database. And I, and I say that with the recognition, the GISAID database has been an excellent and very successful place for people to put sequences and for people to understand what might be going on. But we really do need more than that, which is accessible to everybody in the room without a, without a room full of 30 bioinformaticians to try and understand what those sequences mean. So you need a certain amount of automated bioinformatics capability that provides you with things like rapid analysis within a couple of hours. There's no point in waiting days, weeks, or months before you get um, a sequence. We are able to sequence and, and describe strains. You need the ability to do related matrices to compare sequences from all other sequences globally, and that needs to be automated. You need a user interface that allows real-time insights about the sequence and genomic epidemiology. Uh, whatever we do, we should try and create it so it's pathogen agnostic. And I think this is really important. So, you know, COVID is in the end gonna calm down. But TB has been with us, it, you know, it's the long epidemic and it's still with us and kills 600,000 people a year. We need to use this for flu, for COVID, for TB, for malaria. We need it to cover all the major pathogens and we need to set it up systematically to do that. And, and we need to make it easy so that all you need to do is put sequence out the back end of a sequencing machine and suddenly you'll end up with a cloud-based infrastructure now, the other things that you need are, you really need to make this cheap or free for low income countries because they can't afford it. And we need to build that into the plans. And we also need to arrange a, a sovereign structure so individual countries can own the data that relates to their country and then hopefully share that either anonymously or non-anonymously with the rest of the world. And that we need data sets that will take metadata so a whole load of sequences doesn't tell you anything about the disease. So you need metadata so you can understand which variants are associated with the severe disease, what are the clinical phenotypes. Those are all the things we need. So the job of creating a data infrastructure for this is absolutely not done. And I think it's one of the major priorities that we have to tackle uh, in the next iteration. Well, there are two other areas which I'm not going to talk about, but which have been mentioned by 
other speakers, and I think, but I think I just want to mention them just to be sure that I cover them. One is that testing has been absolutely crucial. And we all realized that testing was something that we needed quickly and efficiently at the beginning of the pandemic. And we've made a lot of progress with existing platforms, particularly PCR and lateral flow. The, the, the other thing which has been really obvious, because I led the lateral flow program in the UK, which as you know, was, has been hugely successful. We've been dishing out millions of tests a day. In fact, on New Year's Eve this year, 4.7 million people between the hours of eight and nine in the evening took a lateral flow test and recorded on the national database. So you could see what was going on. It's a really remarkable um, uh, uh, opportunity. But we also had a whole barrage of new testing technologies, which could never really get there in the time frame. So it's not surprising, lateral flow has been around for a long time and PCR has been around for a long time. And they've been the workhorses in this pandemic. So if you want new testing techniques, you've got to develop them before the next pandemic. Don't wait for the next event to happen. Uh, and, and, but it is absolutely crucial we think about how those might be in play. And the other area, which again, I won't talk about, but which has, I think, been very real, we do need to think about how we get better antiviral, small molecule antiviral drugs, and make them affordable and accessible to the whole world, and also have multiple different uh, platform, multiple different molecules, so that we don't run into the inevitable resistance if we if we have trouble. So I'm, I think that's something that needs pretty serious thought. It's something you could do because it just requires money and effort. The pharmaceutical industry is really good at this. But again, if you start with a pandemic, well, we've seen what's happened. It takes a couple of years to make small molecule uh, um, uh, uh, antivirals, and that's not going to work. So. The, let's now move to vaccines, because that's what this meeting is really about. And, and we've actually got this remarkable momentum in the vaccine world at the moment. The programmable platforms have showed themselves to be really powerful and effective vaccines. And that's one of the most exciting um, developments that's have occurred over all this. But we've also learned a couple of other things about vaccines. One is the utility of vaccines is not always described in the top line data from pivotal trials. And I think we need to remember that because now it's increasingly clear that issues like safety at large scale is important because it's important for trust in the vaccines, but so is durability. We need to understand durability. And as Jeremy said, you know, vaccines that you have to top up every four to six months that, you know, that it's great for putting the, putting the brakes on a bad pandemic, but it's not very good for a sustainable solution. And, and finally, we, when we say efficacy, I think we've got to be really clear. It's efficacy against what? Is it efficacy against transmissions? Is it efficacy against mild disease? Is it efficacy against severe disease? Those are all different things, and we need to understand how they work and how you can define the correlates for those things. So the first thing I think we probably need to work on <coughs> is we need to work on a better understanding of immune correlates. And, and to be honest, that is not a good place at the moment. I, mean, I, I know everybody says, oh, God, we'll measure the neutralizing antibodies. The truth is the neutralizing antibodies don't correlate very well with protection against severe disease and death, as you know. And uh, we've also had these curious paradoxes where new viral variants, which seem to blow through the neutralizing antibodies, um, and hence should, in theory, be serious, to produce serious disease, have in fact ended up in being at the relatively mild or benign end of the spectrum. So there are other domains of immunology, which we haven't got our arms around. T cells and innate immunity are the two obvious ones, but we do need to get better markers for those so that we can really understand how our vaccines are modifying those particular outcomes. We need to think about durability. That's a crucial element of these discussions. Um, and we need to think about how we can make our vaccines much more durable. Now, the problem that we may have run into with COVID with durability may be a feature of all beta coronaviruses. And I think we need to remember that natural immunity to beta coronaviruses is actually relatively short lived. So this may not be the fault of the platforms. It may be a feature of the, of the pathogens themselves, which means that's gonna be a heavy lift to get ourselves to a, a 
position of protection. But, but what we do know is that the vaccines, although they've not been very durable against transmissions, uh, yeah, the UK data suggests they've been very durable against the prevention of severe disease. And, and as a result, since the initial rollout of the vaccines, both AstraZeneca and Pfizer and Moderna in the first few months of last year, the country's been largely protected against serious outbreaks of severe disease. And when we have surges, it's mostly in unvaccinated people. So I think we can have some reassurance that, that in terms of durability against the really severe end of the spectrum, uh, these vaccines have proved to be pretty good. Uh, so, uh, of course, the, the target of trying to get uh, vaccines ready to go in 100 days is a really good one. I applaud CEPI's efforts to try and get that into place. I think, though, and I try and remind people that actually, although that's probably as good as we can get, it might not really be good enough unless we're really well prepared. So if you count 100 days from the time that Omicron appeared on the shores of the UK and was identified, pretty much half the population had been infected. So, and if have that, had that been a highly pathogenic variant, we would have been in terrible, terrible trouble. So although 100 days is probably as good as we're gonna get, we, we've gotta be careful about assuming that's gonna solve all our problems in the next, next pandemic. Um, the manufacturing discussions we've already had, and I think there is now gonna be a global expansion in manufacturing capacity with all the problems associated with sustainability, regulatory approval, know-how and the likes. Those are all issues that I think we're gonna to have to deal with. But I think it is a reality and to be honest, if I was living in the global South and the guys in the North said, don't worry, we'll get you the next vaccine. I'm not sure I would buy that. I'd want to be building my own factory and sorting it out. And I, I, I have complete sympathy with that position. And I think it's not, just, it's not just likely. I think it's highly likely to happen. And I think we need to help a much more global expansion of expertise, know-how, and the capability and the creation of supply chains that will allow that to happen. So where does this all leave us in terms of a legacy? So the, the concept that, that we've been thinking through and working up with Jeremy Farah and Peter Sands and, and um, Seth, Seth Berkeley and Trevor Mundell and others is that what the world really needs from COVID is a legacy that's gonna be hugely beneficial for public health for decades to come. And one of the features that you need if you're gonna create that kind of public health uplift is we need to create a program that delivers adult vaccines much more systematically and effective around the world. Now, it's correct to say we've just built one because most countries in the world have now got at least the nascent capability of deploying vaccines at scale into adult populations. The childhood vaccine program, of course, has been hugely successful but it's a childhood vaccine program. And the real question is that the deployment capabilities for adults and the challenges for adults are rather different. But most countries in Africa now have at least a rudimentary system for finding people, adults, bringing them in using QR codes and IT to identify them and getting a needle in their arm. We're also, remember, so there's a box at the end of this, which we've got now, which we didn't have two years ago, which if we can sustain that, it'll be a huge benefit if we're going to create an adult vaccination program. But also at the, at the beginning, we're going to have this hopefully rapidly and dramatically expanded manufacturing capability. And that's going to provide us with the ability to make many more vaccines, which we can actually use systematically through that deployment scheme that's, that's emerging in almost every country in the world. So we have in a sense in COVID started to develop the framework for an adult vaccination program, which could be a massive, uh, have a massive impact on our ability to generate public health benefit around the world. And when you think about it, you say, what would you fill both the manufacturing um, capability and the deploy and utilize, to utilize the deployment much more effectively? Well, you just need to look at the list. And there is a terrific potential list, which if was distributed through that very simple system, 
would actually save millions of lives a year. And it's obviously new COVID vaccines, which we're going to have. It's also influenza vaccines and probably much better influenza vaccines when the RNA technology gets to them. The new TB vaccine from GSK, which Gates is, is currently in the process of doing pivotal trials on, that's 600,000 deaths a year. That's a massive win for the global public health agenda. The new malaria vaccines, of which the um, Adrian Hills malaria vaccine has got terrific data in children. People forget that actually there may be at least as many deaths in adults from malaria. It's a, as you know, a horseshoe caped, um, uh, 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 horseshoe type curve for mortality. So malaria could be a really crucial thing to put into an adult vaccination program. There's obviously also HPV, pneumococcal uh, vaccines. There's a whole set of things that we could fill this pipeline with, with manufacturing at the front end, a way to use all that facility to make stuff when we don't have a COVID pandemic, but to keep it running in case we need it if there is another pandemic, and the deployment capability at the other end. And then as another, and, and this was Jeremy Ferris thought, and it was a, really a brilliant thought. And that is at the same time that this vaccine, we've had this terrific rush of vaccine opportunities for public health and prevention globally. We're also getting remarkable opportunities to prevent the other major cause of global disease and global premature death, which are the major chronic diseases. And those opportunities come from, things like the siRNA platforms, with which a, with a single dose, you can get a year's coverage of reduction in LDL cholesterol inhibiting PCSK9 with the siRNA. That's the Novartis product called Inclycerin. And of course, there's the development of the Anilin product for reducing blood pressure, again, with an siRNA, long-lived effects that could be given like a vaccine. So I don't, for all the vaccine wallers in the audience, they'll say, well, those are not vaccines. But I say, well, Actually, they are vaccines. They may not be immunological vaccines, but you give them and you prevent disease over something up to a year at least. And of course, there's also the new drug for schizophrenia that comes out of Johnson & Johnson, which again is a long acting agent that could control people's schizophrenia for six months to a year. You've got long acting HIV medicines, which I hope will be able to last at least six months. So you can see that there's an opportunity to shift the focus to public health and prevention for chronic disease and a whole range of infectious disease using the same simple infrastructure. And the great thing about this is you don't need much. Trevor Mundell calls it the clinic, the clinic of the future without the clinic, because all you need is a place where you can get, um, first of all, the data to, to call participants in and patients in, and then people to put needles into people's arms. And the impact of that, I could think, could be absolutely huge around the world as a new structure for public health delivery around the world for adult vaccination, widely defined for chronic disease and infectious diseases, using the pipeline of new vaccines, the rapidly expanded new manufacturing capability, and this really quite remarkable deployment capability that we've never had before. So I'd, I'd like to posit that as something that we as a global community of biomedical researchers should pursue. And I think the only final question, Terrero, that I think needs to be asked is, we can do all these things. It's a real question about whether there's a willingness to do all these things or whether we wanna just pretend this pandemic didn't happen and wait for the next one to hit us. So I think you know what my answer to that should be, but it's still, I think, an open question. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sir John Bell. And, and thank you for reminding us that 100 days may not be ambitious enough. Um, and that's something that we really do need to be thinking about as we think about future uh, pandemics and, and future emerging pathogens. So to wrap us up uh, this, uh, this evening, this uh, morning um, uh, in New York, is uh, Dr. Matthew Connolly. Uh, Dr. Connolly is Professor of International and Global History and Co-Director of the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy at Columbia University. He's also the Principal Investigator of, of History Lab, an NSF funded project applying data science towards the preservation of public record and accelerating its release. Thank you, Dr. Connolly, for joining us and for helping to close out the session 
uh, this this afternoon. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, when Wilmot asked me uh, if I would join this panel, I was a little hesitant because, you know, looking at how eminent all you are and how expert you are, um, you know, I, I hesitated because as an historian, uh, I was wondering what I could contribute because, you know, after all, the, it's called unfinished business and we're very much in the midst of it still. Um, that said, uh, you know, if you think, for instance, of uh, what a, a historian of science, uh, quite a good one, James Burke once said, he said, you know, why should we look to the past, you know, in order to prepare for the future? And his answer was because, you know, there was nowhere else to look. And in effect, that's what we've been doing, right? This week, we've been looking at some very recent history uh, and trying to learn those lessons. Um, but if you'll indulge me for a moment, you know, to talk about this as history, you know, the way historians like typically uh, try to understand the past is we try to take our distance from it. And uh, there's a very, you know, old idea. Um, and, you know, Hegel probably put it best. He said that uh, very poetically, he said, the owl of Minerva takes flight at dusk. So in other words, it's only when an event has ended or even a whole epoch you know, has come to an end that you could begin to get some perspective on it. Um, but there is one aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic that is over, and it's been over for more than two years now. Um, that's the history of trying to predict this pandemic. And in fact, uh, I think there's already, from what I can tell from you know, the last few days, there's something of a consensus that's beginning to emerge, at least among the kind of public health experts that are assembled here. And it's something we heard you know, several times this afternoon about how it is that you know, this is not a black swan event, you know, that uh, we should have seen it coming and some of us did. Um, and you know, if, if everyone you know, had simply paid attention that all of us could have been better prepared. Um, now that's incredibly important if that's true. Uh, it goes directly to this question of trust, right? Because of course, you know, the public is more likely to trust public health experts if they credit them with this you know, provision, right? If we actually can predict the next pandemic um, and if the public is willing to give us the resources then we will be better prepared for it. Um, so just to take an example, this is from Monday, you know, when we started, uh, Jeremy Farrer talked about how it is that there had been 20 years of warnings for a pandemic like this, and that we failed to take it seriously enough. And again, this afternoon, Dr. Carroll and others talked about how this wasn't a black swan. Um, and yet still, you know, you heard Oliver Watson talk about how uh, we were not prepared, you know, and that includes public health experts as well. So how can both of these things be true? Um, how could it be true, you know, that this wasn't a black swan, you know, people saw it coming and yet still we weren't sufficiently prepared. So to try to um, get at this, uh, I want to leave you with th three thoughts. Um, this is an area I, I have worked on a bit. Um, and if you have uh, thoughts that are different than mine, I would love to hear from you because I, I'm going to be a little bit provocative. Um, first off, you know, the people who work in this area, you know, prevision, um, you know, one of the main problems is uh, is hindsight bias. You know how it is that we look back and we we tend to see the things that we eventually know to be important. And so I'm going to talk for a moment anyway about the difference between having strategic warning of something coming and then tactical warning. How different that is and how important that distinction is. I also want to talk uh, secondly about uh, complete and incomplete forecasts. Right. So it's one thing to say you know you know there's going to be a pandemic. You might even know that it's going to be a zoonotic virus. Uh, but if you can't say when and when it's most important to be prepared, then that really poses a public policy kind of challenge, right? Uh, where it's not only public health experts uh, that have, have something to bring to the table. Um, and then finally, the third thing I'm gonna talk about very briefly is confidence, right? And it seems to me that our confidence collectively and our ability to forecast pandemics, uh, it goes in cycles, right? And there have been times in which, you know, the, the field has been quite confident, right? In our capacity, you know, to be able to predict new pandemics. And there have been other times, like you might even say 2019, when that confidence has not been so high. All right, so first to take uh, hindsight bias. So true, this wasn't a black swan. You know, public health experts have been talking about uh, not just how there was gonna be a new pandemic, but they're running scenario exercises. I did something like this with Steve Morse uh, here at Columbia. This was back in, in 2011. And you know, by that point, it was already so routine that we did it with students. And we did it in New York, or we centered this in New York, and we imagined you know, all the, the kinds of disasters that would unfold. And so we, we planned on things like school closures and how it is it would bring an economic depression and, and all the rest of it. 
So it's tempting to say, especially now, you know, all these years later, that every school boy and every school girl knew that something like COVID-19 was coming. Um, but, you know, I'll leave it to Steve Morse, you know, if you don't believe me, no one has ever actually predicted any particular pandemic, right? Now, that may sound surprising, but think of it, you know, if we draw an analogy with the military world, right? So, yes, there was strategic warning. And to draw the analogy, let's say it's 1941. So Franklin Roosevelt knows that Japan is going to attack. Does he know they're going to attack at Pearl Harbor, right? That's the difference. And it's really an important difference. Um, so many people, for example, thought that the next pandemic was likely to be a flu variant. And that makes a difference in terms of how we prepare. Secondly, complete and incomplete forecast. So to talk about Pearl Harbor again, um, you know, Roberta Wallstatter wrote the, the classic study. She says, it's not true that we were caught napping at the time of Pearl Harbor. Rarely has the government been more expectant. The problem was that we just expected wrong, right? So if you know Steve Morris, you know how it is. He had a government funded project, you know, predict, you know, that was aiming at trying to detect new zoonotic viruses uh, before they would pose a global threat. Now, what we were doing was just a scenario exercise, right? So it wasn't meant to predict the future. Uh, even so, you know, if you had to grade us, you know, the Columbia way, I mean, we might have gotten an A minus at being Columbia because you always get at least an A minus. But if you if you were more rigorous, you might have said that we got an incomplete, right? Because we predicted the what, you know, it was going to be a highly transmissible and virulent virus and the how, you know, that it was going to come from close contact with wild animals and international travel. But we couldn't say when. And look, for example, you know, at, at some of the bigger, more ambitious uh, pan pandemic scenario exercises like Event 201 in October 2019. If you listen to what they said at Johns Hopkins, you know, the, the Gate Foundation funded scenario exercise, they said we still have five to 10 years to prepare. OK, so this is 2019. Right. So this doesn't suggest that people in the field were sounding the alarm, right, that there's a pandemic that's imminent and the timing matters. Right. If you have to you know, stockpile sensor material that has a limited shelf life. Right. Um, and also you have to think about all the other planetary threats, because there are all these other groups out there who would tell you that it's their scenario is the one that we should really be worried about. So I did this myself. I work with others in the nuclear threat field. We had our own scenarios about nuclear nuclear threats. Um, and they too have been saying we haven't been doing enough to prepare for this. Um, okay, so one last thing about the public health field. So it's not a hypothetical the way a nuclear attack is, right? Every year, millions of people die from preventable and treatable diseases. So even within the public health field, you have to think about your priorities between the next pandemic and tuberculosis and rotaviruses, right? And I think that makes for a big difference in terms of how public health experts talk about these things. So whereas the climate change people and the nuclear threat people are constantly sounding the alarm, the people in the public health field tend to be more measured. But it's not only because of all the other public health priorities. It's also because of the history of crying, uh, you know, sounding the alarm when things don't pan out that way. If you go back to February 2020, if you, like me, were a listener of, of TWIV, Vincent Rack and Yellow's popular podcast, they had an episode, February 2020, when they said that they were not at all concerned about COVID-19 becoming a global pandemic, all right? And I think the reason for that is everybody knows, I got a minute, good, my last point. So they, they, they knew full well that from the swine flu affair to H1N1 to Ebola, you know, public health figures who were out front sounding the alarm had their reputations damaged and it led to policymakers discounting their warnings. So what is to be done? I'll tell you about two projects at Columbia, reach out if you're interested. I'm working with Sid Dalal, he's a statistics professor. We're building a platform to try to crowdsource um, different kinds of ex experts with different expertise to try to prioritize you know, the different kinds of planetary threats that we think are most alarming at any particular moment. And so I would love to, to have participants join us and, and please reach out if you'd like to. And lastly, um, my group, History Lab, we're working with journalists and public health experts, including Wilmot and uh, Larry Stanbury and others. We're starting to aggregate hundreds of thousands of documents from the history of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're trying to build an archive. And we're gonna use uh, data science methods to try to mine that archive to try to develop new insights that might leave us better prepared for next time. So with that, I thank you. Thank you again on behalf of the Institute of Social and Economic Research and Policy. I wanna especially thank Wilmot James. And I wanna thank also uh, Harlow, uh, they've been fantastic, and it's a huge, you know, um, boon to ISERP, you know, that we've had the two of them. And I, I'm very sad to see Harlow is leaving us soon, but it's fantastic that that Wilmot will still keep working with us, and we can keep organizing these programs. So thanks again.
Hi, thank you, Dr. Connolly. My name is Jill Wick. I'm the Director of Digital Strategy and Marketing here at Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York City. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers today. This was a really engaging discussion to close out the 2022 Vaccine Symposium. Fabulous job, everyone. And I know I've said it every day this week, but it really bears repeating. A huge thank you to the Grodman Family Foundation and Pfizer for making this event possible. Thank you to our external partners, the Rhodes Trust, the Atlantic Fellows, and the Schmidt Science Fellows. We really, really appreciate all of your support. And to our internal partners, the Vaccine Safety and Confidence Building Working Group, VaxSafe, and the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, ISERP. And lastly, thank you to our symposium conven conveners, Dr. Mark Grodman, Dr. Wilmot James, Dr. Phil LaRussa, and Dr. Lawrence Stanberry. Um, and to all of the behind the scenes teams, team members, for all of your support, um, our web producer, Farha Anjum, uh, our IT support, Liana Piccarillo, Crystal Vega Gilb, and Simone Chin, and to the amazingly organized coordinators, <laughs> Maitri Mahita and Harlow Zepting. Um, so everybody at Columbia University as well that supported the event, thank you. You can watch the recordings from the entire week, all of the sessions this year um, on the Columbia Med YouTube. Uh, and we, we hope to relive this excitement again next year. Thank you, everyone.